witness hearing on American Indian Alaska Native programs on the jurisdiction of the Interior and Environment Appropriations Subcommittee. I want to welcome the distinguished tribal elders and leaders uh, testifying today in the audience. Most of you have traveled a long way to be here. We thank you. I hope you'll seize the opportunity to meet with other members of Congress outside of this committee to remind them that honoring the nation's trust obligation and responsibility shared by all members of Congress, regardless of our state or congressional district. I can assure you that your voices are heard by this subcommittee, but we need your help to continue to build <coughs> awareness and support among our colleagues in Congress. For those of you new to this process, I think I see many of you who are not new to this process, but if you are, uh, today's hearings is just a start of a dialogue we come to depend upon to help us make smart choices in the budget and, and earn the votes of our colleagues. Be assured that American Indian and Alaska Native programs will continue to be a non-partisan priority for this subcommittee, just as it's been in recent years under the chairmanships of both Democrats and Republicans alike. Before we begin, I have a little housekeeping. Um, committee rules prohibit the outside use of cameras or audio, uh, audio equipment during the hearings. A hearing, however, can be viewed in its entirety on the committee's website, and an official hearing transcript will be available at GPO. Gov. I'll uh, call each panel witness to the table one panel at a time. Each witness will have five minutes to present testimony. Your full written testimony will be included in the record, so please don't feel pressured to cover everything in five minutes. And as I mentioned, finishing early, you earn brownie points. Not necessarily more money, but <laughs> more brownie points. Uh, we'll be using a timer to track the progress for each witness. There it is. When the uh, light turns yellow, a witness will have one minute remaining to conclude his or her remarks. When the light blinks red, we'll ask the witness to stop. We'll hear from every witness in each panel before uh, members will be provided an opportunity to ask questions because we have a full day ahead. I like to keep things moving. Uh, airplanes are leaving uh, this afternoon, and I know everybody's concerned about thunderstorms and so forth, so we'll try to keep things on track. With that, thank you again for being here, and I'm happy to yield time to my friend and colleague, Mrs. McCollum. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You've been talking about brownie points. It's after lunch. Maybe maybe next year we can have brownies. There you go. Uh, That's a good idea. I, look, I thank everybody for coming. I look forward to the testimony. Okay. Okay, we have our first panel this afternoon. Um, and we'll start with Ashley Tomey, who is the president of the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Welcome. Uh, Chairman Calvin and Ranking, Ranking Member McCollum, good afternoon. My name is Ashley Tuomi, and I am a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and I am an urban Indian. My status as a tribal member does not change based on the zip code that I live in. I am here today as the president of the National Council of Urban Indian Health, and Nukui represents urban Indian health programs across the nation that provide accessible, high-quality, and culturally competent health care to the American Indian Alaska Natives living in our urban areas. I also serve as the CEO of American Indian Health and Family Services, one of the urban clinics in the Bemidji area, and I'm located in Detroit, Michigan. My testimony today will focus on the Indian Health Services. Chairman Calvin and Ranking Member McCollum, your subcommittee is best positioned to understand the health care related needs of urban Indians. I am thankful for your continued support of urban Indians and recognition of the federal government's obligation to provide health care for American Indian Alaska Native people on or off a reservation. I first would like to take a moment to thank you for the support in the fiscal year 2018 omnibus spending bill. Your work to prioritize UIHPs above and beyond the administration's recommendation is greatly appreciated. We are deeply concerned that this year the president's budget for fiscal year 2019 includes a decrease of nearly $3 million for our urban Indian health programs and would be a huge step backwards from all the work that this committee has done to protect the health of urban Indians. With only $49 million in funding, UIHPs receive an average of about $721 per patient per year. For other Americans, that number is almost $10,000 per patient. Unlike IHS and tribal facilities, our programs do not have access to additional line items such as purchase referred care or construction dollars. We are already funded minimally and cannot easily withstand any reductions. Instead, we propose an increase in UIHP funding of at least $32.7 million to provide existing ambulatory services and improve our current services. The amount of Medicaid service costs paid by the federal government is set by law at 100% for IHS and tribes. But for UIHPs, 
This does not exist because the we did not exist when the law was written. Congress created UIHPs to respond to the tribes that wanted to ensure their members would continue receiving quality health care off the reservations. According to IHS's latest um, study, the cost would be minimal at $2.3 million annually. 100% FMAP for urbans would help stretch the budget this subcommittee provides to IHS. And with many of the proposed changes to our health care system, UIHPs will be left behind and unable to negotiate with states if we have not achieved 100% FMAP. With all the success of the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, we are pleased that the administration has included it in the fiscal year 2019 budget. However, it greatly concerns us that this funding source has been moved from mandatory to discretionary, and many UIHPs fear for the future of this program. IHS and tribal providers, as well as other comparable health, health, federal health care centers, are covered by FTCA. UIHPs, however, have denied this, denied this coverage and must purchase their own expensive insurance on the open market. With FTCA coverage, money spent in insurance costs would instead be available for the provision of additional services, and this change would maximize the value of your appropriations to IHS. As many of you recall from my previous testimonies, the Department of Veteran Affairs and IHS have implemented an MOU that reimburses IHS and tribal providers for services rendered to veterans who are also IHS beneficiaries. However, this agreement does not include reimbursements for UIHPs. I appreciate the continued support from this subcommittee regarding this issue, and I was pleased to see that there has been some movement through the last ominous bill. Under the Urban Indian Health Line item, IHS was directed to work with the Veterans Affairs on the report examining services for Indian veterans at urban clinics. We are hopeful that this report will be quick and that we can move forward in making sure that our Native veterans living in urban communities have access to timely, high quality, and culturally competent health care that our UHPs can provide to them. In January of this year, CMS released a letter announcing that states could implement work and community engagement requirements for certain Medicaid beneficiaries to meet. Although we support full employment for of American Indians and Alaska Natives, this approach is neither in line with the trust obligation of the U.S. government, nor does it respect the inherent sovereignty of self-governing people. We stand with the tribes in expressing concern about the administration's viewpoint that our tribal members cannot be exempt because of civil right concerns and stating that the request from exemptions is race-based. As you well know and have voiced um, throughout these hearings, the federal government has a unique legal and political government-to-government -government relationship with tribal governments and a special obligation to provide services for American Indians and Alaska Natives based on these individuals' relationships to tribal governments. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. In review, um, we have submitted our full written um, request with further details on all the subjects that I talked about. Thank you. Thank you and your full written uh text will be part of the record and uh, we'll be reviewing all of that so we appreciate that next uh lester thompson jr chairman of the crow creek sioux tribe south dakota you're welcome okay Correct. good afternoon chairman members of and members of the subcommittee my name is lester thompson chairman of the crow creek sioux tribe located in buffalo hughes and hyde counties on the eastern bank of the missouri river in central south dakota Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding issues of immediate importance to our tribe. At this time, sir, I would like to humbly request that my elder statesmen get to take the lead real quick um, as we uh, share similar subject matter and that we can coincide with each other as we speak. The gentleman chooses to yield time to him. And, and that I be able to follow suit afterwards. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully, just stay with our. Well, thank our you. Time frame as much as possible. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman Calvert and uh, Ms. McCullen. Basically, we, um, you know, it's honored to speak for you to here today. And uh, we, uh, in Lower Brule, you know, we ran into since becoming in, coming into office, you know, we have a GSA lease with uh, our detention facility. And th the history of the detention facility is uh, we were fighting condemnation of our own. And as we were having a dialogue with the BIA, we use tribal money. We worked with the BIA over BIA specs, built a facility up to their standards, and we've had a 10-year lease. It's been going great. Um, although the OMN, O&M money hasn't been sufficient, we've been getting by. Since uh, I got into office, the lease was up in two years. I, we've 
been working hard on trying to get a renewal, suddenly um, the BIA does not have that authority. And we're trying to figure out where that authority lies and how we can get it done. I've been working on it for 18 months and um, you know, we need that facility. It serves Lord Brule and Crow Creek. Uh, now we've got people that are getting shipped from South Dakota to Oklahoma to serve, as well as, uh, you know, Montana, Wyoming. Juveniles, they shut our wing down. They come out with new regulations over uh, sight and sound. And we do have alternative funding, and that's how we built it, with alternative funding, not from the government, but tribal dollars. And uh, the OM does come from the government, and we want to serve our people well, and we want to keep them at home. And um, basically, we're uh, looking for help, you know, and as all the other tribes and tribal people come up here, you know, we're going to probably hear about a lot about the shortness of funding. But this one here is... Uh, to me, is something that they've had, you know, and that authority to do probably since the Snyder Act of 1924. And I don't know where that authority went to. <laughs> and I don't know if the GSA, BIA is fighting, but it is much needed on both reservations. And like I said, we will build a, a new juvenile wing if uh, we get a lease that, that we'll is look comparable. Into that. We'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah. Also, it's... It, it's holding up processes for other tribes who want to use their own funds for hospitals, even Lord Rule for a new uh, yeah. health facility. But thank you for yielding sure. right there, and I'll turn it back over to him. We'll take a look at that. Question? Thank you for that, sir. As part of that is follow-up to what Chairman Janju, or Chairman Gorno had brought forth. Law enforcement is very important in Indian country. What we're running into is it's a shared facility between Crow Creek and Lower Brew, which is located on Lower Brew Reservation, as Mr. Gorno had pointed out. Um, because we share the facilities, we are already at capacity for housing detainees. Um, it is a regional jail, so what happens is we end up coming to capacity and then our, our detainees get shipped out to multiple areas. And it does cause, cause major problems as far as family visits, so on, and, and bringing our people back after they're released. Um, leading into another issue, Lord Brew and Crow Creek are currently sharing law enforcement as far as police officers go. Crow Creek is cur currently almost up to staff. Lord Brew is not at staffed at all in law enforcement. So what is going on is our officers from Crow Creek are covering Lord Brew, and it is a large area to cover, especially when it's almost one man per shift. Now, when it comes down to that, our Crow Creek itself is 422 square miles, and that's a big coverage, basically 70 miles lengthwise, 30 miles widthwise. I personally know what it's like to cover an area that big as a, a former police officer of our tribe. Um, massive land base. Then you throw in Laura Brew, who has a similar land base one officer covering that is is not enough. Justice is not being served for our people at all. So those, those areas do need to be addressed. Um, one other area, while I got a little bit of time, is IHS, the funding for dialysis. Um, IHS currently does not cover dialysis at all. It is a major issue in Indian country. Uh, there has to be attention paid to this. We transport people 60 to 120 miles off of our reservation to receive dialysis care. Um, if there is a possibility to seek some kind of funding to build a facility or a provide equipment for our region would be greatly appreciated. Pretty much all the time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, Robert uh, Flying Hawk, Chairman of the uh, Yankton Sioux Tribe. Oh, be down my up at You and I'm trying to stand up at you. up at all. I'm going to let me talk. I'm talking to you much. Thank you for uh, having us, this, giving us this opportunity to share our, our comments and our concerns. I, I, I say thank you, and I greet each of you from the bottom of my heart with a handshake. My Indian name is is uh, Matokinaji, which translates bear who returns to his place. Uh, I'm my uh, given name is Robert Flying Hawk uh, and chairman of of the Hongtua 
which is known as the Yankton uh, tribe or the nation. And so I'm, I'm here uh, respectfully, humbly, in the tradition of, of our ancestors, of our elders who have come here before uh, with these types of requests that uh, are presented by our, our relatives uh, and our neighbors, uh, uh, our other tribes who, who uh, we, uh, as, as people live here on, on this, this land and, and uh, have those challenges that are, uh, that are before us. Uh, I was uh, 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 writing uh, something to, to, to share from, from the heart, from, from me personally, and we've been uh, struggling with, with uh, the, uh, the law enforcement and, and how to, how to uh, uh, combat uh, the, the forces that are at home in, in, uh, in our lands, in our, in our houses, with our members, uh, that being a drug. Uh, as, as I got up this morning, I received uh, some information, some news that uh, uh, another one of our children attempted uh, to, to, to end uh, his life or their life. And uh, last week uh, in our schools, uh, uh, a dorm student did just that. Uh, we, there's a funeral happening uh, this, this weekend. And so with these... Uh, cuts that are suggested, these, these deficits in, in some of the programs that uh, are suggested for this budget of 2019, it's going to be uh, hurtful. It is a matter of life and death for, for us at, at home on, on our reservations, and, and we want you to, to hear us. Uh, we are sincere. We are telling truths here. Uh, we we have a life that we live and and we adapt and and we are going to continue to live uh, the uh, treaty was was signed and and those are legal and moral commitments and promises that uh, were were uh, discussed and and we feel that maybe uh, we might be shying away from those uh, in working with uh, 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 us and, and, and as a federal government. Uh, I know growing up I was told uh, the, the, the uh, grandfather at, at, uh, at, at the Washington office was, was talked about and said we're going to see him, we're going to be asking these things, we're going to talk to him about these things. Uh, our, our homes uh, need, need some repair, our, uh, our, our families need something to eat. Uh, we we have uh, people coming in from the outside with something that's not good for us, a, a medicine that that affects our minds and our well-being and and our health overall. So we are here. I'm here to to ask on behalf of the Hunks, one of the the Yankton tribe, that that you hear us, that you listen to us, and that uh, these proposed uh, 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 actions that might be happening with that. 2019 budget not happen and that you reconsider uh, uh, looking at those programs that that benefit us as as people uh, at, at home on the Yankton and 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 on all of our other uh, reservations uh, that that we have we we have uh, our law enforcement our IHS uh, uh, the, the the Department of Interior covers the 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 Bureau of Indian Affairs that has all of these programs. Uh, the Bureau of Indian, uh, Indian Education, uh, we, we need our children uh, as education. Uh, some of us uh, have some problems with, with uh, the dorms where this incident happened, uh, staff, money to, to provide the adequate staff to, to help uh, uh, monitor our children, to provide programs where where the uh, these types of things, the the, the wellness, uh, our mental wellness, and and our, our overall health is 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 going to be addressed. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to to say thank you, Pidama at the Doha, uh, uh, for for hearing us, and and uh, I hope you will listen to us. Well, thank you, thank you for that uh, moving testimony. First, let me make sure that everyone rest assured that uh, we. Uh, uh, we uh, we work together on uh, uh, 
Ms. McCollum and myself to, uh, to make sure that we do everything possible within the allocation that we're given uh, to make sure that we meet our obligations uh, in, uh, with the Native Americans throughout the country. And so uh, the President's budget, obviously, just as we, we worked on it last year, uh, we'll make sure that we uh, fulfill those obligations in the FY 2019 bill, which will come out here shortly, so you'll be able to take a look at it. I, I think you'll uh, see that it's much, uh, a much improvement. Um, one of the uh, issues is detention facility. We'll look into that. Uh, I know that uh, we have had these issues uh, in not just uh, in South Dakota, but in other locations. I, I'm just curious, how many people do you have incarcerated in that facility? It's, uh, there's a incarcerated facility at the uh, Okay, excuse me. The capability is a 48 unit, 48 bed unit. 48, okay. So relatively small facility. So yes. It's, okay, so it's, and, uh, and the other issue too was on the uh, dialysis. How many people do you have under dialysis uh, in that region? Estimates are climbing every day. We figure about 80% of our people have a, how do you want to say, type 1, type 2 dialysis. Oh. There are, as far as diabetes, there's, um, I don't have the exact number for dialysis care. Um, the number, like I said, grows every day. And it, it's a compounding effect. What happens is first a diagnosis, then treatment. Um, a lot of times, if treatment isn't received properly, there's loss of limbs, which adds compounds to other medical treatments, and it just keeps compiling. It, again, this is why we're looking for some kind of help here. Diabetes is a horrible disease. It is, sir. Okay. Um, and this opioid issue, uh, this is a constant refrain that we're getting uh, f from virtually every witness uh, here today. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a plague, by the way, that's affecting uh, every part of our society, you know, rich, poor, every, you know, but it seems to affect uh, tribes uh, more than, than most, I suspect, because it's along the routes a lot of the drugs are being transported and so forth so uh, uh, it's a, an issue that's uh, very important to me and, and to many of us here so it's something we have to stay on top of we have my commitment on that and uh, urban care is an important part of uh, in my area is very important too so it's it's so it's something we we, we keep track of so we'll continue to work with you miss McCollum just, just quickly, and you can get back to our, our stats. When it come, when you, with what you're talking about, the memorandum of understanding with the VA, do you want that to move faster? Um, I, uh, if you could get back to the staff on if medical records are, you know, how you're going to do the medical records transferred back, back and forth because different centers might be on different... I want to make sure they're interoperable. Is what I'm trying to say, yeah. and then and then how do and then how prescription drugs are going to work because sometimes purchasing through the VA is cheaper than what maybe um, someone getting a script from your op, uh, office, you know, doctor's office, going and getting it filled there. So if you could let us know how um, we can stay on top of these memorandum of understandings with interoperable, uh, making sure that. Uh, medical records are operable back and forth and, and to make sure that we do what we can to make sure that, that prescriptions we get, because the VA buys at a better a better rate. I'm, I'm assuming you don't have a pharmacy um, at all of your facilities. Not at all facilities. Yeah. Um, and as far as the interoperability, you know, we're aware that the, the VA is looking at changing systems and IHS is going through that discussion now um, because we were both kind of operating on the RPMS system. So there is discussions on both sides about switching to new systems. So that'll play into that conversation of interoperability as well. Um, and as far as some of our facilities do have pharmacies, and we do have access to, to the 340B program. Right. Um, but I'm but sure they all don't. Yeah. Okay. So, M Mr. Chairman, you and I have been on the, I've been on the VA MELCON committee as well as the defense committee, which we both serve on now, watching the interoperability not uh, go very well with medical records. And I think maybe we can stay on this one on top of it now that we know the VA is changing. Um, I just want to take a second on um, the dialysis um, question because I had a family member in very rural North Dakota 
eastern Montana, go from Sydney, Montana to Williston, North Dakota. All kinds of weather conditions. And quite often you have a person who's medically fragile being driven by somebody who is um, elderly. Um, so, you know, in, in, it's, it's, it's tough to ask people to do that in good weather conditions, but when you're out there in a blizzard, I know, can come up and you can have a whiteout and pretty soon then you're trying to find a place to stay and be safe and all that. Um, I know Malax, the Malax uh, band in Minnesota was looking at, at doing some dialysis. Is it the fact that if you have a dialysis treatment center close to the reservation, is it full or is there just nothing uh, available? Because it might be something where we want to, we should be talking to the states and the governors about, um, with, with some of their health needs, about how do we make regional facilities. There is a facility that is close, but most of the time it is fully full. booked. You know, the idea would be, you look at, if you would look at a map and look where Crow Creek Reservation is located at, we're almost dead center in South Dakota. Um, okay. you, if you would do a circle, we would be able to serve not only natives, but most likely non-natives too. I mean, it would, it would be beneficial all the way around for the area. Are you, do you, are you aware of, do you have opportunities to have discussions? Um, Ms. Ms. Nome is, does, does, a, does a great job and we're, we're working uh, with her and, and others on uh, an Indian Health Care Task Force and I'll ask my staff later where we are in the di dialysis um, treatment uh, sp a spectrum. I know some of these facilities are like running two shifts. Some of them, you know, I've talked about even running three at, at times in rural areas. So looking for efficiency and opportunities to do public, private, or public, public partnerships. And this might, might be a, a good, good place to start, especially in the Dakotas. Can I make a comment? On, on the Dallas, it's Lord Brew, we, uh, we take them to Chamberlain, that's 30 miles away, two shifts. Other people, like my aunt, goes to um, Mitchell, which is 100 miles away, right. one shift. And I see what you're saying, and we do need a facility, you know, Crow Creek and Lord Brule, and, you know, it would, uh, unfortunately, people are waiting for others to pass away to get their slot, you know, and that's how, what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you. That's yeah, not that's, good. That, yeah, that's a hard reality, but it's very true, true in these areas. That just makes the diabetes program and prevention even all the more important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully someday we'll find a cure for diabetes, and that uh, will be a big day. Okay, well, thank you very much for, the, for coming out. We enjoyed uh, listening to your testimony, and uh, we'll take your comments into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we'll have our next uh, panel. Please uh, come on up. Uh, David Omar. Yep. Okay. Come on up, and, uh, and others. Uh, da David Omar kills 100, trustee two. The Flandreau Santi Sioux Tribe. Harold C. Fraser, chairman of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Jennifer Mc McLeod, board member, Association of Community Schools. And Irvin Carlson, president of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. Welcome. I think everybody gets a seat there. So I remember you, David. You got a, you have the cool name here. So, oh. <laughs> thank you. Okay, David, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, like the uh, previous chairman, I was wondering if I could allow my elders to go before me, if that's okay. Absolutely. to have you speak. Quite in now. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Jennifer McLeod. I am a board member of the Association of Community Tribal Schools. I'm an elected leader of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. 
and I'm an educator. Of all the titles that I have, the one that warms my heart the most is the educator. And I would tell you that becoming an elected official was not on my career path. When I was in the classroom, I was very happy to be there. But after time and the conditions that I had to work in and what I saw my children having to be in, I knew that just being an educator, just being in the classroom teacher and being a school administrator even, didn't give me enough of a voice to be able to change the things that I need to have changed for our children. Being here today is the first time that I've been able to come and speak before a panel such as this, and I want you to know that that is a life goal for me. To get here now and have five minutes of your time, and I know that you've got good hearts because I was here yesterday and I watched you, and I know that you want to help us in any way that you can, and I know that the stories that I'm going to tell you, your heart will hurt too, just like mine did being there. I know that you feel the, the pain of children who are cold and when I had to tape bubble tape on my windows just to get the temperature up to 49 degrees to keep my kids warm. I had to use duct tape on broken asbestos tiles to protect my kids from breathing those things. I know that that's touching your heart. And our children, all children, deserve safe, warm places to be so that they can learn, so that they can reach that creator-given purpose that they have for being in this planet. That today is why I'm here, to talk to you about the conditions that children have to try and learn in. My conditions, cold and the asbestos, are small compared to what some of the schools have to endure in other places. We have schools who have no heat. We have schools who have water issues, who can't have sanitation, who have food issues, children in dormitories, staffing. It's very, very difficult, and sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because I can see that you all know exactly what I'm talking about. But unfortunately, to improve those conditions requires dollars. And that's why I'm here to talk to you, to, to help us find a way that we can work together and find those dollars to improve the conditions for our children. I want, I want to thank you for the appropriations that that we just got. We were so worried, we were scared about what was going to happen to our children. And then when, when the appropriations came through, we rejoiced as much as we possibly could because we knew that we were going to be able to at least continue the way we've continued this year. And, and our children would be at least that okay. But that's not what we're looking at coming forward. Coming forward is frightening. And I don't know how we're going to help the 30,000 children that are in tribal schools and 130 schools. The appropriations that we have now, the way it's, it's scheduled, my school will not see any dollars to help with that facility for over 100 years. That's the schedule. Some of the buildings that schools have are 100 years old already. What are they going to be like in another 100 years? So we, we need to do something, and we need to find better ways. I have this list of asks that I was sent with, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure that you're going to tell me that we c you can't give me all of these, but I'm going to ask for it anyway, because I do go to those, all those offices up on that hill. I go from next one to next one, and I ask every single one of them because we have to keep bringing these issues forward. We have to keep talking about these needs so that we can help. The fiscal year 19 request is not acceptable. We lose $50 million, that's over $1,000 per child. They would have less. There'd be no books, there'd be no money for technology tools, nothing to read, nothing to write with. So you've got our written documents, the data's there, we've got some beautiful charts and things that you can see how the appropriations have gone up and down. And my words to you today are to ask for your help and whatever it, if you need me to come back and speak to somebody else, point the way, I'll be there. Because it's that important, whatever it takes. Well, we appreciate your, uh, your testimony and uh, uh, we'll be working with you to do exactly that, so. Miigwech. Uh, David? Oh, we're going to go to Ir okay, Irvin first. Okay. I'm the, I'm the youngest yeah. here. 
Okay. Hold uh, on. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Silver, and fellow committee members, and also Mr. Scott. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today before you know, the esteemed body here. My name is Irvin Park, and I'm the president of the Tribal Buffalo Council and also an honor of the Blackfeet Nation. I'm here today to ask this committee to recognize the importance. Sorry about that. I'm here today to ask this committee to recognize the importance Buffalo play in the lives of Indian tribes and to financially commit to their restoration after almost achieving um, their extinction of the Buffalo. While the federal government has recognized the importance of indigenous foods such as fish, whales, and wild rice, it has not recognized how important the buffalo, now the national mammal, remains to tribal people. And most of the people you've seen here today that were at the tables are all part of uh, the organization of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. ITBC seeks to improve the health and welfare of American Indians and Native Alaskans by restoring buffalo to tribal land. It's talked about diabetes here. We try to help in that area of um, getting our people back to eating our native foods, and buffalo is a big part of that. Um, it's rampant in Indian country diabetes. And, um, and we, we also, within ITBC, are trying to create a health initiative to get our people back and starting from our young ones in the schools uh, back to eating buffalo um, to also help in that area of health. ITBC does us providing grants and technical services to tribes, promoting the spiritual and cultural connection between buffalo and tribal people, advocating against the slaughter of buffalo, assisting tribes with school lunch programs, and translocating buffalo to tribal lands. ITBC was founded in 1992 with seven tribes. And 26 late years later, ITBC now has 65 member tribes, and we cover 19 states. Collectively, within those tribes, we have 20,000 buffalo. And that's more buffalo than all of the national parks combined. And uh, they have a far more uh, significantly higher budget than I know we have, So, and we have far more buffalo that we're managing. Um, within that. However, ITB's funding has remained stagnant and is insufficient. For the last 10 years, ITBC has only received 1.4 million funding annually while its membership continues to grow each year. Um, funding comes from a discretionary line item in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Natural Resource Budget, and we do we do appreciate that, that funding that we do get it, but you know, we have, like I say, our, our organization grows each year by two to three tribes. I'm here to request this committee to create a program in the Department of Interior's budget to provide adequate funding for ITBC, ITBC's efforts to restore Buffalo to tribal lands. We hope to increase its funding by 5.6 million for a total of seven, 7 million. Each year we have our tribes put in their, their list, uh, a one-page concept letter of what their needs are. This year, and each year with the tribes, some of them hold out because we try to make the money go around. This year we had 30-some um, tribes that put in for, for the grant, fund granting. And um, that, that, request from them tribes was $9 million. So, and that was not even half of what our membership is and what their needs are. So all of this is necessary to promote the self-determination of tribes, restore the cultural and spiritual connection between Buffalo and tribal people, and fulfill the government's trust responsibility to American Indians and Native Alaskans. And again, I want to thank you for this opportunity, and I welcome any question that you might have um, for myself. Thank you. Thank you for testimony.
Mr. Frazier, uh, Harold Frazier, Chairman of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Thank you. My name's Harold Frazier, Chairman of Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, also Chairman of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman Association. I come here today to ask that you honor our treaty. These resources that have made this country powerful and great came from them lands. But yet, we, the Sioux Nation, we are the poorest of the poor, high poverty. If you look at the statistics, they show the poorest counties in the United States are in Sioux country. We don't have a casino, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Because of that poverty, we fight suicides, meth, things like that. Last year, looking at our statistics, there has, was over 11 attempts per month suicide. You know, these current funding formulas do not fit us. There's tribes that have no reservations, no roads, but yet they get millions of dollars more than we do. Our reservation is 3.1 million acres, 1,000 miles of road, and yet we're funded at $2 million. You know, last week, April 29th, was the 150th year anniversary of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And I rode with our people horseback all the way, over 350 miles. And when I got there, I was really disappointed and saddened to see that there was no one there but a park ranger who was dressed like Smokey the Bear. And that was the representative of the federal government. And it told me that even though there's a treaty between our nation and yours, it will never be honored, it will never be recognized. But I also felt that someday it will be honored. We need to stand up and fight for our treaty. Because if it wasn't for them treaties, we wouldn't be here. We know that. We Indian people were excluded from everything. Other races are put higher than us. And we were here first. And in closing, back home, many of our people say, honor our treaty or give us our land back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to apologize to my fellow members here. <laughs> Tribal leadership has a tendency to age you prematurely <laughs> beyond your years. Um, good afternoon, Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is David Kills 100, uh, Trustee 2 of the Flanders Santee Sioux Tribe. Uh, on behalf of the Flanders Santee Sioux Tribe, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today regarding to issues of importance to our tribe. Uh, but before I begin, I would first like to thank both the members and the staff on both the majority and the minority who serve on the House and Senate committees on appropriations sub subcommittees on the interior environment and related agencies for their efforts in assisting the tribe in securing much needed funds within the fiscal year 2018 continuing uh, resolutions for the tribe's joint venture health clinic with the Indian Health Service. Um, you took action after hearing the tribe's concerns in the same uh, hearing last year and now the tribe and its members and the entire community are benefiting from a fully funded state-of-the-art health care facility. Um, the tribal clinic is only one of the many issues of importance to our tribe. I'm here again today to speak to those issues uh, and seek solutions that will serve for the best interest in the tribe and our people. Um, opioid addiction and its collateral consequences are debilitating Indian country. The Flanders Santee Sioux tribe is plagued with an epidemic of opioid addiction and abuse, uh, causing a substantial loss of resources with little to no funding available to address this serious issue. 
Every facet of our community has been affected, including a direct impact on children suffering from the abuses of adults that care for them. The adult uh, or the cost on the uh, tribe are not only emotional and uh, physical, but financial. We have seen costs increase dramatically as the epidemic, epidemic expands. Uh, we have seen increases in public safety needs to combat the epidemic, increases in health care and rehabilitation services to those who have been suffering and the families they have impacted. Our community will overcome. That's our nature, but we need help in this battle. Uh, most government funding programs allocate funds to the states with the expectation that the funds will trickle down and find their way to Indian country. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, tribes are disproportionately affected by the methamphetamine and opioid abuse, and our tribe is in crisis situation, and as such, our limited resources are overburdened and have been exhausted. To address the uh, impacts of the methamphetamine and opioid abuse, uh, and the unmet needs facing our community, we urge the subcommittee to increase our funds for IHS mental health services, alcohol and substance abuse programs, as well as increased funding for an inpatient long-term treatment. It is critical and necessary. Um, public safety is of the utmost importance to the tribe, especially in the region currently damaged by methamphetamine and opioid abuse. As a result, expenses in our uh, operating our tribal law enforcement programs have increased exponentially while funding has flatlined. An issue we touched on last year before the subcommittee uh, was the need for a detention facility to house individuals arrested on the reservation. This need has now grown exponentially. As you will all recall, the nearest uh, detention facility for the tribe is located 125 uh, miles away from the reservation. Uh, this distance puts the significant burden on our tribal police who must make the 250 mile round trip in order to place those uh, who they have arrested into a detention facility. The situation takes officers away from duty on the reservation for substantially long periods of time and poses a serious and significant safety risk to the community. The need for a local detention facility to house individuals arrested within the tribe's jurisdiction has been a critical need for our tribe for years, and we have been actively trying to remedy the situation, but we need your help. In uh, uh, 2012 and 2013, our tribe received funding for planning grant to design a local detention facility. With this funding, we successfully obtained the design plans but have yet to receive funding to build the detention facility. Our need for a detention facility has now reached desperate levels. With timely and proper funding, our tribe can quickly start new construction and begin to alleviate some of the substantial burden that has been placed on our tribal law enforcement. Again, we request appropriations for the construction of a reservation-based local detention facility. And I did thank the uh, committee earlier for assistance in obtaining the funding that was uh, contractually obligated by the federal government to uh, the tribe for the health clinic. However, the funding that is owed to the tribe for operations of the clinic has been delayed for long periods of time, creating serious problems with operations of our health clinic. Often we're forced to overburden tribal funding sources to pay for operations for the clinic, including payroll and supplies. Uh, when funding is constantly, uh, consistently late, the clinic is without adequate funds for operations, programming, and contract support costs. This jeopardizes the health of our community there needs to be a faster way to receive uh, funds through the Aberdeen Area Office in South Dakota. We ask the committee to seek workable solutions to this problem and respectfully suggest IHS into uh, restructuring the protocol of process for funding distribution. It would also be beneficial uh, to timely approve the uh, appointment for a new director of Indian Health Services and other positions critical to Indian country. Please keep in mind that both uh, police and healthcare treaty our treaty and contractual obligations of the United States. The Flanger Santi Sioux uh, Tribe thanks the subcommittee for its efforts in addressing tribal priorities and addressing the critical needs of tribal communities. The decisions made by the committee impact the lives of people in the Flanger Santi Sioux Tribe, and we ask that you take that, uh, take our requests into consideration. Thank you, and thank, thank you for all your, uh, your testimony. I appreciate it very much. Um, School construction, it's uh, high, high on our list, and uh, uh, this has been very important to Ms. McCollum also. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, the we got a, a BIA school that's over 60 years, 60 years old, a shining beauty school. And uh, anyway, um, when we applied to get on a construction list, um, the BIA they never entered any data into the system. So therefore, we did not qualify.
qualify for a new school. However, when you go to the school in January, I went over there four times, and we, we were getting down there around below zero weather. I mean, it's just shameful that our kids, the junior high, had to go to class with jackets on. I mean, I got pictures of a wall on the west side of the school where you could just see outside. And it ain't our fault. It ain't our kids' fault. It's the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, 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 and they're not living up to their trust responsibility. So I, mean, I, I just want to say that for the record, that if there's going to be a new school, there needs to be different criteria developed on who gets a new school. I know it's very competitive, so thank you. No, and I, I appreciate that. Actually, uh, we have uh, probably about a billion dollar need out there. I mean, we go across the entire Indian country. If uh, We significantly increased uh, construction account this year in FY18, and uh, we want to continue to do that and, uh, and try to start catching up. And I was going to ask you a question, Ms. McLeod. Uh, in addition to construction, we've been increasing the BIE operations and maintenance funding over the last several years. I'm just curious, is some of that money found it, uh, in your direction? Yes, it has. We replaced yes, it has. We had to replace failing boilers. Mm -hmm. You know, the operations and maintenance keeps makes it possible for our children to go to school. We're, we're very grateful for that. But like he said, it's not enough. But there are schools within in the association that they won't even do the repairs because it's too costly or they need to replace it. You know, for, for whatever reason, it's almost like a condemnation situation where we can't fix that furnace. They need a new one, and then there's not enough money for that. Yeah. Well, I, I reckon that we need, to re we need to replace a lot of schools. So we mm -hmm. need to put new schools in. I, uh, we're... we're uh, trying to use some creative ways to come up with uh, financing these schools that be, you know, we did this with the, uh, as uh, Ms. McCollum knows, we did this with the uh, military. We, we, uh, we uh, figured out a way to basically replace the entire yes, schools uh, in for the entire United States military. And you know what We're I also found? in bad shape, and we, and we were able to do that. I'd like to do the same thing. Uh, what was most that. impressive with the military schools was how fast you did it. Yeah. We've got tribal schools that spend years in the planning process. In the meantime, those kids are going without. We need to speed that up. Yeah, no, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, it's a certainly high on on our list to do so, and uh, we're going to continue to press forward on this. And Let me know how I can help. And and uh, and I know that uh, diabetes is a huge issue in Indian country, as it is in, all, in the entire country, but it's certainly, uh, you know, we have a country that's addicted to carbohydrates and sugar. And uh, that's unfortunate, but uh, it, it's a societal problem that we have, and uh, you know I'm probably guilty of it myself. So, but uh, but we need to, uh, you know, native foods are uh, you know obviously a big part of it. You know, with a high protein diet, that uh, you know buffalo is a big part of that. So, uh, so we'll certainly take a look at that. Thank you, Chief. Uh, sure. You know, and especially with diabetes, like Indian people are. Um, I guess our metabolism wasn't, you know, used to the food that, w you know, are now that uh, other than our the traditional foods that we had, you know, and, and buffalo and all of the wild foods that we had. Um, so with that big change in our diet that's, you know, put upon us now and especially with uh, in the beginning with the, um, well, we used to call them rations now, the commodities or food distribution program. Um, you know, that was a big change in our, 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 our foods. And so that's a big contributor in any country as to diabetes. And, and so that's why it's so rampant there also. And, and we're trying to educate and get our people back into to eating those healthy foods that would change that. And that would also help within, um, you know, with the IHS, with the big, um, we talked about the dialysis centers earlier. And, um, and you know tribes have to fund them themselves you know IHS doesn't do that so so w that's a, a help for us to tribes also to not have that expense you know so bad and losing our people to diabetes well saying ounce of prevention is worth a worth a lot so miss McCullough. yes well th uh, thank you thank you for your um, testimony and mr. Frazier you you have wonderful testimony in here. I was looking at it while you were talking and, and noticed the school that you talked about, 50 degrees. Um, 
So I think we need to follow up. If your school was missed, we need to make sure that it is currently in the system now. And um, you are referenced in your testimony that there's mold and there is exposure to asbestos. Um, and you, all, you also, t I, I know asbestos is common because of the time of the buildings were, um, but uh, we, uh, you know, that's a life, health, and safety issue. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't allow any other public building uh, to be open with, with anyone in it, let alone, let, let alone children. So I, I, you have um, our commitment um, to, to work together with you on that. And then the other, the other correlation that I hear and I see here are roads, not only to, to get places uh, safely. Uh, I know there's lack of, I mean, they're not lit at night, planes, the, the darkness, the road conditions, all, all of that. But I'll just focus on one, one part of a road aspect, and that's the road to school. Mm -hmm. So, sir, you talk about how you don't, um, and I know this is true throughout Indian country, you can't even drive the roads. I mean, mm -hmm. they aren't paved, uh, they're gravel, they're washed out, there's no shoulders. I don't know how you get a plow down, down there to make sure you're even hitting the right I spot. I'm sure you've got really good em employees on, on the reservation that do their very best. But then you have to cancel school not just because of maybe the snow condition that one day, but it's snow conditions several other days. And we know, and as you pointed out with, and I'm a teacher too, <laughs> uh, when, when a student's missing school, mm -hmm. they're falling behind every, every time they miss school. Right. And that's not the student's fault, that's not the parent's fault, that's not the teacher's fault, but the person that pays the consequences is the student for the rest of their life. The rest of their lives. The rest of their lives. And that's why graduation rates aren't there. Mm -hmm. Because when, when a student starts hitting junior high school, high school age, they become embarrassed when they can't read. That's so so then they avoid being put in a situation where they have to read out loud. They become embarrassed when they can't do the math and science problem. So um, I just... Uh, you just gave me more more fuel for making sure that the roads are done <laughs> because I think we have to start connecting our roads to school mm -hmm. and the attendance and the consequences of that. So I want to thank you all very much for your testimony. And in Minnesota, we eat a lot of buffalo. We're, we're really liking it. So I want you to be successful. Thank you. Miigwech. Yeah, I like buffalo too. I Just, just one point. I uh, want you to know that we... We significantly increased uh, school construction this year. By we tr we uh, went from 47 million. We put 150 million dollars in for new school construction. 100 million dollars in deferred maintenance, and uh, significant money on top of that for. Uh, so we're going to do more, and we're going to. Uh, and we know it's not enough, but we're going to. We're trying to move forward on this as fast as possible. We have one of the smallest budgets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And then bring some buffalo jerky. Yeah. You're What's that? Thank you. Ah. Good to see you, man. Okay. okay. Our next panel uh, will please uh, come on up. Okay. Hi. See, we're missing. Uh, Somebody here, we, uh, Kathleen. Is, is Kathleen uh, Wooden Knife Council Representative Rosebud Sioux Tribe? Okay. Mr. Chair, we do have we do have um, 
her testimony, so we have it in the I record. I think you're on the next. Yeah, yeah, you're on the next one, Roger. Uh, you're up. Yeah, no, no, no. You're you're on the 2:30 panel, but I think Kathleen uh, is Kathleen, Kathleen Wooden. Wooden uh, uh, Kathleen, knife? we 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 do have her testimony. We do have her testimony. So, oh, but she's not here. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just get going with this uh, this group here. First, uh, let's have uh, Cora. Cora Whitehorse, uh, council member for the Aguala Sioux Tribe. Aguala Sioux Tribe. Uh, close, I got some close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Just, just go ahead and push that button. Uh, there you go. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before this subcommittee. My name is Cora Whitehorse. I'm a council member for the Aguala Sioux Tribe, and I also chair our finance committee. Um, it, it's through our treaties of 1851 and 1868 that the United States cemented its obligations to our tribe. The appropriations Congress provides for Indian programs and services for us are toward the fulfillment and promises the United States made in those treaties. Um, I, I want to personally say thank you for the work that you have done for Indian country. We're glad you rejected the President's proposed budget cuts for FY 2018 and we, we want to remind you that that we hope you do the same for fiscal year 2019. The proposed cuts are, are unrealistic and they totally contradict the United States treaty obligations and trust re responsibilities to our tribe and other tribes. Um, I, my, my first point before I get to our priorities, is um, IHS and BIA need to start to advocate for tribes. I don't know how we make them advocate for us, but when they submit their budget requests, they need to be based on need. We submit our statistics yearly. We submit our unmet needs yearly. But the budget requests that are submitted to OMB are unrealistic and they never come close to meeting the needs of our tribe. They should be realistic. They should at least meet the basic needs of the people on, on our reservation and other reservations, all natives throughout Indian country. Um, our priorities that we submitted in our written testimony the first is law enforcement. Right now, our reservation is over 3 million acres. We have 34 police officers. 34 police officers to service a population of over 50,000 people. We have five, over 500 miles of tribal roads. That doesn't include the state roads or, or county roads or BIA roads. This is just tribal. The average wait time for a law enforcement officer to arrive is 45 minutes to two hours. Imagine what could happen in that time. 34 officers is the same level that we had in the 70s. 12 years ago, we had 129 officers. They were funded through BIA and DOJ, through the COPS grants, but 129 officers at that time still wasn't enough. And right now, because of our, our lack of law enforcement, there's the crime rate on the reservation is just extremely high. We, um, <clears throat> there's just so much violent crimes. There's so much drug problems. And because of our location, there's a lot of trafficking through the reservation, but we don't have the law enforcement to stop it. We, we don't have the law enforcement to take care of the basic needs of the people in our communities. We have um, a facility, a jail facility, located in the middle of our reservation in Kyle. <clears throat> it was, for the last few years, it's been in the design phase to be to have a new detention facility built there in Kyle. It hasn't been funded to be built. In, in fact, it was the last one that was designed through the um, 
the program that when they were replacing all Indian country jails and they just finished the design last year so we need it to be funded to have the detention facility built because the, the facility that they're in right now in Medicine Route in Kyle was um, condemned in 2007 but we need some place to house our offenders. Our next priority is the Tiwahe Initiative, and I'm sure you've heard of it. There was five basic components to the Tiwahe. It was CPS, ICWA, social services, courts, and HIP, and law enforcement. And, you know, Tiwahe was the brainchild of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Tiwahe, in our language, actually means family. And the initiative was to repair families. And um, so we would like to be a part of that. Our statistics were used, but we are not a part of the initiative, which I really don't believe is fair. We have every single component necessary to make Tiwahe work, but we were not given that opportunity. Um, I see the red light flashing. So, <laughs> but I just have two more s things. Um, our roads, our tribal roads right now, we have 560 miles of roads and our road maintenance funding for the year is 540,000. That's not even a thousand, thousand dollars per mile. That's, it's ridiculously low. And when we have, we have several blizzards, you know, South Dakota, and when, when we have one blizzard, sometimes because our reservation is so large, it could take up to 50% of our budget for road maintenance, which is really, really unrealistic. So that takes me back again to our, our priority of finding a way to make IHS and BIA actually be advocates for Indians. They need to submit realistic budget requests. Our budgets need to be based on need. They need to be based on need. We provide the statistics, we provide the numbers, we provide the reports. For what? When they submit their budget requests, they need to act, on act as advocates for Indian tribes, not as advocates for the federal government. Because they were created to work for us, with us, not against us. And right now, they work against us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your testimony. That's uh, Dave, uh, Dave Bloop, the chairman of the Ixcon. Hopton Oyate. Sioux Tribe. Sioux Tribe. Uh, you sound familiar, Mike. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, you don't pronounce your last name. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, thank you for coming. Mija de Dakota wo daka pewa chi. We had to kashina yapi, tao yate. Okay, mija de chantewa shte anna pechi uzapi. Eh, we tanko hukshina macha. Na si si tu anu akpeto e tancha he macha. My name is a boy who leaves big tracks, my Dakota name. I'm the chairman of the Sistan Wapton Sioux tribe. And I too, uh, as my uncle Robert, we shake your hands with a good heart. Uh, so, the. This afternoon, Chairman, Ranking Member, um, we uh, have heard a lot of public safety needs. Uh, I do agree with all of my colleagues and I do support uh, all of the members of the Great Sioux Nation that are here. I support the gentleman that, that had discussed the Buffalo needs. Uh, you know, we are members of the Great Sioux Nation, more commonly known as the Ocheti Shakuni, the Seven Council Fires. For me, on the Sistan Wapton Sioux Tribe, we've been working solely on uh, uh, an, an all-inclusive justice facility that would help uh, alleviate the catch and release that, that is happening on my reservation. Right now, BIA came in, they closed down our detention facility because we didn't meet any one of the standards. That, that was a couple years ago. And I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm very humbled to say this. Um, I am also very proud, so please, please, please don't take this out of context that I'm being arrogant. But the Sistan Wapton Sioux Tribe, with our special counsel that's in this room here today as well, Mark Van Norman, uh, we, we carried the weight in the omnibus bill that put in uh, monies for new detention facility construction. We're very thankful 
uh, for the North, North Dakota, South Dakota delegations uh, and, and their colleagues working to support that or to get that bill passed. So we're very thankful. Uh, we were on the list and we have been on the list. We verified that through uh, our congressional delegations. We've had letters of support from Governor Dugard, uh, from the state of South Dakota, from Governor Burgum, from the state of North Dakota. Our stats show on the Lake Travers Indian Reservation that crime is rising. Methamphetamine use, opioid use, it's, it's on the rise and we need to fix the problem. And we need to go back and we need to ask ourselves, how, how do we fix this problem? So the Sister Wapton Sioux Tribe has been working solely on public safety, and I think it runs parallel with community health, if not concomitantly. Yeah. We've, we've, we've heard, we have, we have many needs, and I just want to mention, I was very honored to ride with, with, uh, with Chairman Frazier on the Fort Laramie ride. Um, we have a lot of needs in education, health, economic development, but as a member of Great Plains Tribal Chairman Association, as Chairman of the United Tribes of North Dakota, I hear the most uh, common thread out there is public safety and community health. This is an intergenerational problem we have. We're not fixing the problem. We need to get to the root of the problem, and that's we're not getting our people the treatment they need. So my pitch to you today and my request is that there be appropriations put into uh, treatment facilities uh, for those tribes that need help with staffing. Uh, we've, we've, we're in support of, of all of the sister tribes and their need for detention facilities for uh, upgraded treatment. But for the Sister Wapton Sioux Tribe, we have, we're not per cap tribes, you know, as Chairman Frazier said. And, and, and there's a lot of us that aren't per cap tribes. We're not 280 tribes. We are treaty tribes. And there is a federal responsibility to uphold those treaties and, and, and in the policies that are made thereafter, such as the Tribal Law and Order Act. The Tribal Law and Order Act uh, requires that, that the federal agencies work with the tribes to, to create a tribal action plan. And for the Sisson Wapton Sioux Tribe, our number one priority has been public safety and the community health of our people. And that's where I think, and that's where I would argue that in getting the, our, our people fixed is going to help alleviate those other problems that, that we see that are systemic across Indian, the, the education, the lack of good parenting, and I hate to say it, but it's the truth. And again, it goes back to being intergenerational. We're not fixing the problem. Detaining people is one thing. We got it. It's unfortunate, but we need to incarcerate some people, some bad dudes out there. We need to get them off the street. Uh, my tribe uh, recently passed the Controlled uh, Drug Act. Uh, where we banish people. That's an inherent right of our, of our Dakota people. By the way, we put the Dakota in North Dakota, South Dakota, and walleyes are a staple in our community, right, Congresswoman? So um, just wanted to mention that, um, that we would greatly appreciate appropriations going into the construction of new treatment facilities. We have a comprehensive plan uh, that we've been working on. There's $1.2 million been invested in, in, in this plan from the United States government and the tribe, and we'd sure like that funding to be put into there so we could build phase one and two, which would include adult and juvenile treatment facilities so we can help get our people fixed. And it's not just our people, it's going to be the entire community. So thank you. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Brandon uh, Muai, uh, Tribal Council member, Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribe. Thank you, uh, Chairman Calvert, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brandon Maui, a councilman from Standing Rock, and today my testimony is going to focus on health care, welfare, public safety, and the education needs of our tribal members. You see, Standing Rock has a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States of America reflected in our 1851 and 1868 treaties. And these treaties underscore the United States' ongoing promises and obligations to the tribe. And today our testimony is submitted with those promises and obligations in mind. Standing Rock encompasses 2.3 million acres in North and South Dakota. Approximately 8,500 of those of our 16,000 tribal members and 2,000 non-members reside in eight communities spread across the reservation. The Tribal Council's core mission is to improve the social and economic standard of living for our members living on the reservation. You see, despite the tribe's best efforts, our unemployment rate remains above 80%. And in fact, over 40% of Indian families on our reservation live in poverty. 
more than triple the average U.S. poverty rate. The disparity is worse for our children, as 52% of the reservation population under the age of 18 lives below poverty, compared to 16% and 19% in North and South Dakota, respectively. This is the kind of poverty that is the root cause is the host of uh, health, social, and public safety challenges that we are charged with overcoming. And today we ask this committee to be a partner in overcoming those challenges. The tribe battles the chronic and insidious impacts of substance abuse on our, in our communities. We, like all of Indian country, like you've heard today, are facing an opioid and meth, uh, methamphetamine abuse crisis. Addiction can be lifelong and must be treated as a behavioral health illness. And tribes need additional mental health specialists and substance abuse counselors to combat this issue in, in a holistic and a productive way. Another area of deep concern for the tribe is the welfare of our children. Statistics demonstrate that an overwhelming need to increase services to the families so that our children are not put at risk. According to the 2016 ACF report on child maltreatment, Indian children account for almost 30% of the abuse cases in North Dakota and almost 45% of the cases in South Dakota. However, we are only 5.5% of the population in North Dakota and only 9% in South Dakota. And finally, according to the Ann Casey Foundation in 2015, 27% of the children in foster care in North Dakota were Indian and in South Dakota, 49%. 49% of the children or in the state's foster care system. The tribe's CPS program, Child Protection Services, works very hard to address the needs of our children, but the magnitude of those problems demands more. And this is why the Tiwahi Initiative is important as it seeks to address these issues from all directions. Of course, we need more investigators and foster homes right now. We only have two investigators to cover all of Standing Rock, only two and only six approved foster homes on the reservation. But we have to work to address the root causes of why our children are in jeopardy in the first place. We must work to provide people the social, financial, and emotional support that they need to be healthy and strong parents. So we urge this committee to fund, to increase funding for both BIA and social services and ICWA programs so that we can work with families so that they have the resources to stay together and they have the safest alternatives when we do not have to remove them from the homes. You see, without these resources, we will not be able to meet the needs of our most vulnerable population. And finally, public safety is a priority, as you've heard all across Indian country. You know, we only have 11 officers to patrol our entire 2.3 million acre reservation. That amounts to approximately three officers per shift, assuming no one is sick or on leave, and I, I suspect that there are more than 11 Capitol Hill officers guarding the Rayburn building right now. I don't understand why the people living on the federal reservations are any less deserving of protection than the people who work in this federal building. We strongly support an increase in funding for FY19 for law enforcement and other services at Standing Rock. You see, we're not, we're asking that you continue to that you uphold the treaties, but not only uphold the treaties that you've engaged with the, the um, First Nations people with us, but at least acknowledge the Constitution. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, and thanks uh, to all of you for your testimony. Um, uh, I can't think of an area that uh, in the country that uh, is more in need of of. Uh, of meeting our obligations in South Dakota, North Dakota. It's uh, certainly, as, as the testi testimony has indicated, is some of the poorest areas uh, in the United States. And uh, um, I wasn't able to go with uh, Tom and others uh, when you uh, were out there just recently, but uh, I, we need to do that and, and where we all have a better idea of what you're having to deal with. Roads that are obviously endless and uh, distances that are that are large and uh, rural areas, and like you say, in the transit routes of 
drug activity uh, here in the United States, unfortunately, and uh, everyone getting caught up in, in that. And of course, the lack for, of justice facilities and law enforcement that has to deal with incredible um, distances that most people just can't comprehend. And, uh, and I'm sure you don't have helicopters and uh, things of that nature to, 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 to deal with that kind of thing. So uh, we have special needs that we need to deal with. And, uh, uh, and I know foster care, I know we have a facility in my area, uh, Sherman Indian Institute, that's been around for a long, long time. And of course, they've changed the, what, they, they, a lot of troubled kids uh, end up over there and uh, try to help you know, separate from times from parents that, like you've mentioned, that need help. Unfortunately, the parents need help too, but uh, to separate these kids from sometimes uh, the violent uh, areas and so forth, and so uh, uh, we're we're uh, we're making progress. Not quick as enough, <coughs> like you said, with school construction. Uh, we did add some money for detention facilities in FY18. Uh, we we're looking at FY19 also, and uh, we're going to try to make it a lot of, so, and for uh, healthcare uh, for uh, pick some of these hospitals. And I know that your region was in the uh, needed desperate attention to that. I'm hoping that that money is going there as we, as we speak and uh, we're making some progress, but uh, we have a long ways to go. Ms. McCullum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as was pointed out, um, unfortunately, Kathleen uh, Woodenknife wasn't able to be here and I did look at her testimony and Mr. Chair, she brought up something that in the years of taking public testimony, I have not heard anyone address. So I just want to have that voice heard. Um, she brought up a uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs burial assistance. And there's head shaking. The Bureau maximum burial payment stands at nearly $2,500. A waiver can be granted by the Secretary upon retribal request. However, any increase in maximum burial payment standard will only equate to higher burial payments received by fewer people. And she goes on her statement, and I'll close with this. Inadequate maximum burial standard payment and funding for indigenous burial assistance service has left the Rosebud Sioux Tribe desperate to find resources to help ensure that our tribal members are provided with a respectful burial. And I think we all want that for our loved ones. So I just wanted, I wanted people to know that um, that, that was seen, that was heard, and we will um, look into it together. Uh, the uh, other two things I just wanted to point out that's come up uh, in testimony here, and um, uh, Mr. Maui, it was in, I think it's your testimony, I found it, where it talks about the committee supporting the community health representatives programs. Right. We've heard from many tribes on, on that and the importance of the wellness checks for the elders to ensure that children make dental appointments and to provide members with rides to medical appointments. Lots of times um, it's an elder, they don't drive anymore, right. or it's someone who's going through chemo or something like that where they just don't feel strong and well enough to drive on these roads that we've all heard about. So right. there's, that's been brought up several times and I wanted you to know that, that we, we recognize that. And then the other thing, that um, has been brought up throughout the testimony the past two days is opioids and meth. Unfortunately, methamphetamine in, in many parts of Indian country is still, still um, rampant and it is as destructive in a different way as meth uh, as opioids. But I think because opioids has affected a broader U.S. population, it has gotten more significant um, help but we still need to be able to uh, make sure that when we're talking about mental health, wellness, behavioral health, and help with this crisis with drugs, that we do not forget that what we put forward also reaches out to those tribes and those members uh, dealing with methamphetamine. So I thank you all for, for bringing that up. But I wanted to make sure that um, Kathleen words were heard because I never thought of it that way and it reminded me of funerals that I've attended with people who have really had to scrape together, literally, I'm not kidding, pennies 
to, to bury someone with dignity and respect, and mm. everybody deserves that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I respond briefly? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Ms. McCollum. Um, the CHR program on Standing Rock has been, and I think um, many CHR programs, has been operating off of a budget that has been over 20 years old. There has been no increase, yet the um, statistically, you know, uh, sickness has increased over those 20 years. And uh, diabetes, we've heard diabetes, um, heart disease, all of these things have increased. And yet we're still asking more of uh, the CHR programs. And so when we talk about IHS and CHR, um, I, I ask that you look hardly at that because that is an area of great need all over Indian country um, so that we can continue looking after, especially our elders. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, anything? No, I, I'm sorry I got here late, obviously, but I have had the opportunity to, as you referenced, Mr. Chairman, to visit Standing Rock and uh, Cheyenne River and Pine Ridge and uh, Rosebud. So. Uh, uh, firsthand familiar with how challenging the situation is, how remarkable the people are, but how desperate the situation uh, in terms of isolation, lack of infrastructure, you name it, economic opportunity. So uh, it's uh, something I wish more Americans saw because I think it would make them more determined to fulfill their trust obligations. Uh, and uh, so I, I appreciate you coming here and, and making the case and uh, appreciate the things you do. and. Uh, I know in this committee, in a bipartisan way, we'll do everything we can within the allocation that we have to help you address some of these genuinely staggering problems that you're facing and that your people are facing. Th back. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and uh, we appreciate your having, having, having you. Okay, our next uh, committee, uh, our, our panel will be uh, Mr. Roger White Owl, uh, Intergovernmental Affairs Liaison. Good to see you. Um, Roger Trudell, Chairman of the Santee Sioux Tribe. And Victoria Ketchikyan, Councilwoman of the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska. Welcome. Let's see, Mr. Uh, Roger Whiteald, Intergovernmental Affairs Liaison, Mandan Hadaska. Uh, I'll uh, take it from there. You're, you're recognized. It's pronounced Hidaza there, sir. Hidaza, okay. Well, I'd like to start out by just saying, Pompi Shishna Dashkashna, Nidoshadze, Jeed. Just send hello and greetings to you in Mandan, Hidaza, and Arikara, the MHA Nation, the three affiliated tribes. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Roger Whiteall. I am a citizen of the Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara Nation. I currently serve as the MHA Nation's Intergovernmental Affairs Officer for Chairman Fox. The Chairman regrets that he was not able to be here today and asks that I thank you for the opportunity to present our appropriations priorities. The most important issue the MHA Nation faces is the impact of the dual taxation on our tribal budget and your federal budget. As many of you know, over the last 10 years, the MHA Nation has been in the middle of the most productive oil and gas field in the United States, the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. Over this same 10-year period, the state of North Dakota took $1 billion, $1 billion in tax revenues from our reservation. Over the next five years, the state will take another billion dollars in tax revenues from our reservation. State dual taxation drains the revenues we need to develop our resources, build our infrastructure, and provide services to our citizens. State dual taxation increases our dependence on the federal budget. While North Dakota is sitting on a $4 billion rainy day fund, the MHA nation had a $2 billion shortfall. 
In the next 10 years, we estimate that we will need about 3.6 billion to maintain, 3.6 billion to maintain our infrastructure, staff our government, and keep up with growth on our reservation. This is the same infrastructure that the federal government is struggling to fund. Our roads, law enforcement, housing, health clinic, and more. State dual taxation takes the very resources that the tribal governments need to keep up with the growth and support vibrant economies. Every study shows that the state dual taxation limits tribal economies and depresses the broader state and regional economies as well. Over on my right, there is a chart from the president's budget justification showing the economic impact of Indian energy development. As you can see, Indian energy development added 9.6 billion to the national economy in 2016. Why would you limit this economic engine with state dual taxation? A, s a small clarification updating the Indian mineral leasing laws would address this problem. Congress should clarify that Indian tribes are entitled to the full benefits, including taxes, of resources developed on our lands. Until this clarification is made, the states will continue to drain our tax revenues, and we will continue to ask the subcommittee to make up for those losses by increasing funding for the for federal Indian programs. Law enforcement is a perfect example. The demand on our law enforcement resources has increased dramatically from 2015 to 2016. Arrests on our reservations rose from 30 to 103. The amount of meth seized rose from 220 grams to over 1,037 grams. Illegal use of prescription drugs rose from 14 cases to 870 cases. Missing children reports rose from 0 to 16, and missing persons report rose from 0 to 5. We recently used 17.2 million of our own funds to construct a new public safety and judicial center. The center provides space for law enforcement, a 911 call center, and our tribal courts. To operate that center, we will need an annual funding of 9.5 million. Roads are another good example. Recent estimates for new road construction to meet industrial standards are about 4.5 million for a half a mile. We need about 215 million to cover existing road construction and about 1.2 billion over the next 10 years to maintain, maintain our reservation roads. While this subcommittee tries to fund all of the competing priorities in Indian country, at least one billion dollars in tax revenues from our reservation is sitting in North Dakota's four billion dollar rainy day fund. This makes no sense and limits what the MHA nation is able to do for itself. We also ask that you address the new issue in BIA leasing of tribally constructed facilities. BIA recently ran into issues with GSA when trying to lease facilities constructed by tribes according to federal standards. These facilities were we had to build because the BIA could not find the funding. The fiscal year 2019 bill should grant BIA full and unilateral leasing authority. Finally, we continue to, we continue to need funding for frontline BIA staff to stay on top of the energy development. This includes Office of Trust Funds Management staff that work on our reservation. They oversee thousands of Indian accounts and provide vital customer services to our citizens. They could not fulfill the federal trust responsibility and provide these services without a local presence. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm available to answer any of your questions that you may have. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ro Roger uh, Trudell, uh, chairman of the Santee Sioux Tribe. You're recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you, and I'm sorry for charging your table earlier. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, We're happy Ms. Here. McCollum, and Mr. Cole, <laughs> glad to be here today. Yeah, and I think I'm, I was here before, a couple of years ago. Uh, we presented, uh, you know, written testimony to you, and I, I know that you read it, so I'm not going to sit here and read you my what you're going to read after a while anyway. Uh, I, I want to take some time. I am I'm also the chairman of the uh, Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, 
and uh, I, I noticed there's a lot of questions about health and diabetes and that type of stuff. So it's an area that, and especially uh, mental health, it's an area that you know I have a lot of concerns in. So uh, have any questions that I can answer after a while, I'd be more than glad to. I'm also accompanied by our CEO. His name is Dan Redall. He's sitting back here somewhere. Uh, we, um, you know, we experience a number of things on our reservation. We're not, we're not one of the bigger reservations. We have one of the smaller land bases. We're 12 by 17 miles. We're in northeast Nebraska, Knox County specifically. It's <coughs> one of the poorer counties also in Nebraska. Uh, steadily losing its, uh, it's about 10,000 people in that county and that, that population is uh, declining every year with the exception of our tribal population which goes up about every year. So. <coughs> We have, um, you know, some economic development of our own. We need more. We have uh, sea stores, two, two on a reservation and one south of the, the city of Yankton, South Dakota. We also have a casino. It's a class two casino. It's not a class three. Uh, we don't have a compact with the state of Nebraska because none is required. We don't earn enough to have, uh, uh, you know, per capita to the people. Our sole intent was to provide employment for tribal members. 85, about 85% 85 of the employees at that casino are tribal members. So, you know, that's one of our goals uh, was to employ tribal members. Overall, I think we employ a couple hundred tribal members uh, out of a population of, I think, close to a thousand people actually on the reservation, given on whatever day it happens to be. We do have a highly mobile population of about 10 percent that tran you know that's transient between the reservation and Sioux City, uh, Iowa, where there's another uh, substantial amount of Santee Sioux living. We're uh, originally from the state of Minnesota, where we moved in uh, 1863, 1862. Uh, we have, our, you know, our tribe. Uh, has the record, uh, which is not very uh, popular record, I guess, for having the largest mass execution of uh, our people. Thirty-eight members hung at one time at Mankato, Minnesota. So, uh, you know, uh, that uh, that's a subject that kind of doesn't sit very well for a lot of people. We don't like to discuss it a whole lot, or do we do have a violent history, uh, which leads to a lot of, I think, problems with our young people. Uh, and our, our young people put themselves in some uh, dangerous situations. Uh, and uh, sometimes our parents put our children in dangerous situations. And we don't have the safe houses for them to take them out of those situations. And, uh, you know, at one time uh, the health board asked Indian Health Service to go to every reservation and assess every building on those reservations because the excuse for everything is we don't have beds. There's no beds for youth. So we said, go to every reservation and let's uh, have, the, have the buildings there assessed. Maybe we can convert something. Doesn't matter whose reservation it is. Maybe we can convert, f make beds for some of our youth uh, to get them out of the drug and alcohol scene and uh, out of uh, maybe homes where it's not safe for them. Uh, currently, we have people that pick up our some of our younger people when they hear that they're you know, to, uh, com you know, thinking about suicide or whatever, they'll pick them up, drive them all around all night until they're settled down. You know, most of the time it takes about 12 hours really to to uh, make contact with that youth and get them back into a point where where they're like themselves again, or they can cope with whatever situation they're in. Uh, so I look at facilities in a sense that, you know, if we could take a child out of a bad situation for 12, 24 hours, uh, save that child's life, we've accomplished whatever we need to accomplish. Uh, child suicide is probably the worst thing that uh, could ever happen anywhere. And I know our reservations in the Great Plains have dealt with epidemic proportions of child suicide. And uh, we do not have the mental health resources that are needed on the ground to deal with the number of issues that we have that need to be dealt with. Uh, you know, at some time, if we don't get our young people at an early enough stage, you know, we're going to continue to lose that generation. 
and we, and we can't afford to lose those generations. You know, some days these people are going to be the leaders of the tribe and they're, you know, I don't know what the result of long-term uh, meth addiction is. I'm sure you're not functioning the way you should be. And these people will be in charge of everything, eh, you know. So we need to really look at it in the sense of self-preservation, <coughs> that we need to pack this and, and get it cleaned up, and get our people straightened out, make them think proudly of themselves, respect themselves, or, you know, we, will <laughs> we won't be around in a, another few years, I guess. So <laughs> I'm sure you hate to see that, sir. <laughs> So thank, well, thank you. you I see you on the red light. So. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Uh, next, uh, Victoria Ketchayan, uh, Councilwoman, uh, Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska. Welcome, and uh, you're recognized. Good afternoon. My name is Tori Ketchayan. I'm a member of the Winnebago Tribal Council. I'm an elected, uh, excuse me, I'm a member of the Winnebago Tribe and elected member of the Winnebago Tribal Council. I also serve as the Great Plains representative and vice chair of the National Indian Health Board. And I want to thank this subcommittee for your time today and for the, um, the wonderful staff Darren Benjamin has been to um, our endeavors and the steadfast, steadfast support that he has shown to the Winnebago Tribe. And I thank you for that, sir. And I'd also like to publicly acknowledge our Congressman Fortenberry and his Chief of Staff, Dr. Archer, who has been very helpful and a champion um, along this path. As noted at last year's hearing, it was really difficult for me to come here and tell you that things had gotten better. And here I sit today um, and, and announce that we still um, house the only federal facility to lose its CMS certification. We're going on three years. July 23rd will be the third anniversary of our loss of CMS certification. And it, it appears that um, there's not a application on the horizon. And for that reason, you know, I come here again to say that um, in 2015, the Winnebago Tribe was adamant that the agency should fix this. The agency broke it, the agency should fix it. Well, as the days, the months, and now the years have passed, the Winnebago Tribe has taken a concentrated effort towards um, self-governance. And it was a decision that the Tribal Council um, monitored and, and learned about and the failed bureaucratic system and the dozens of deficiencies being managed from hundreds of miles away was not making any progress. So it was at that point that the tribe had decided to take a monumental challenge of taking on the management and assumption of this facility. I'm pleased to announce, though, to the subcommittee that the Winnebago tribe has requested and has been formally approved by the to participate in the IHS self-governance program through the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act. We are engaged in negotiations with the July 1st assumption and we are, um, we know this is a major undertaking, but we're confident that the tribe can do it and the tribe can do it well. The health care of our community is at stake here and we believe that no one else is vested in that interest but ourselves. To that end, we're taking the necessary steps to rebuild a strong team, develop partnerships, cr create strategic planning, um, also in line sustainable uh, operational and financial plans and recognize that in order to be successful, we're also going to need outside help and the continued um, support of, of your help as well. Um, well, the additional accreditation emergency funds that you so generously and kindly allocated um, have helped us stay afloat. The hospital administrative, administrative infrastructure, service delivery systems are not going to be easy tasks. We're going to have to create new hospital systems, develop policies and procedures, hire, recruit, and train staff, provide extensive training, uh, hire accreditation specialists and consultants. So this journey is not over for us, rather it's just begun as we make some hard decisions about existing equipment, reestablish our hospitals of credibility with Medicare and Medicaid, um, th other third party payers, the surrounding local medical community and facilities in the Siouxland area. Um, we're also hoping to rebuild the confidence in the patients, our tribal members that, that, and the many other tribal members that facility serves. We're prepared to do the work, but we make no false assumptions that this is not going to be challenging and we have some serious obstacles. And I'm also a little sickened to, you know, think about the money that has been lost over this s lack of certification and that the American taxpayer has to had to step up and fill the void and it's these losses that we simply cannot um, continue and that the agency has failed us and it's sad that um, that we're at this point but I'm telling you it's going to be a new day in Winnebago and it's going to be a new day in the Great Plains and um, as far as our status and specific needs, of course, our goal is to provide the best services possible while 
um, the credit, like I said, the accreditation emergency funds have helped a great deal. We won't want to see those continue to be used in the ED. You know, that's not a long-term solution. We'd like to see permanent uh, um, qualified staff. We'd like to see um, uh, the loss of the third-party revenue restored. We'd like to see all the necessary steps, the training, the focused um, effort to restore that certification. And we also want to stay in contact with the agency and make um, IHS continue to partner with us as we correct this together. You know, uh, uh, make no mistake, IHS is not off the hook here. So we'd like to remain partners. And aside from, you know, some of our hospital assumption and CMS accreditation, I wanted to just briefly mention behavioral health. You know, we've heard some about the CHRs and the lifeline that they are to the Native community and the, um, the preventative care. You know, we're catching people who could be going into a diabetic coma, and these CHRs really are a lifeline for us. I want to also impress upon the Im uh, importance of the sanitation infrastructure, and that also remain a priority. Um, I would mentioned that we're a member of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, and I serve as the proxy. And we stand in full support and solidarity of Pine Ridge, Rosebud, and all the other Great Plains tribes that have literally, you know, been hanging on to their certification by the skin of their teeth, as they say. But um, it's it's quite, you know, apparent that there's an inadequate amount of money and attention to these issues. But for this reason, we call upon this subcommittee to continue to do everything in your power to support our relatives in South Dakota as well as Nebraska so that we can, you know, help ourselves um, come out from this situation and, and really provide the quality that our tribal members all deserve. We recently learned that Shine River, Ogallala, and Rosebud will be um, announcing their plans for the reconstruction and re in, um, invigoration of the IHS Sioux San Hospital. So we just ask that you please support them as well. And, you know, they are starting on a new course and it's going to be um, impact lives. And we've got a large tribal membership and those uh, members qu count on that Rapid City facility. And so that's just not a solution for it, it to go away or be reduced any way. We just um, support them. Also, because my colleagues have done such a good job over these past two days of commenting on the illogical and unsupported FY19 proposed budget for BIA and BIE, I won't go through that, but I just want to say that we also stand with them and ask for your ongoing support for these areas and just that we're thankful to be here today and to share these thoughts and concerns and that we can continue this dialogue so that we can come up with some sustainable solutions for all of our tribal members. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Whitehall, could you, uh, for the committee, uh, the uh, taxation uh, per barrel of oil, for we can better understand that. How, uh, maybe you can get us a summary of that uh, that we can put into the record. I'm just curious, uh, how are the, how, when you extract a barrel of oil from the ground, uh, how much is the state of uh, North Dakota extracting from you? Extracting from us in in the form of a tax. In the form of the tax. On, um, well, it is, it is set according to the uh, index of pricing of uh, Western Texas uh, WTI is probably yeah. the best way to explain that. How much and, per barrel? Is and um, fifty percent of it. Fifty percent of it. What we have. Okay, and that's that's through the state of uh, North Dakota. North, uh, that's the state of North Dakota. Right. So that. Was uh, is because they own? Do they own fifty percent of the resource? No, they don't own any of it at all. They just have uh, well, a, on so trust land. On trust land, um, they don't own any of it at all. It's one hundred percent ours, and should be as as a by right. And and the and so when you say a dual tax, where's the what's the other tax? Um, well, we have a tax sharing agreement uh, per se. Um, it's at ten percent total, so we get five percent. They get five percent. Can you, so. can you just give, give us a breakdown just for the record? I just like to look at that at some point. So sure. Just, just we can yes. I will definitely get that to you as soon as we and can. And how does that compare office. with other uh, uh, tribes around the country? Other tribes around the country? Well, we have a we were one of the first ones to establish such a such a tax agreement with the state of North Dakota. And uh, it wasn't very conducive to the three affiliated tribes at first. Actually, the deal was a 80-20 split. The state got 80%, we got 20%. Um, in the agreement in and of itself, we come back to it since the North Dakota legislature meets biannually uh, every two years. Um, we decided that it was going to be renegotiated every two years. So if there's a new incoming council, they have different priorities or anything as such that they could negotiate that. And uh, luckily, uh, we were able to 
help some of the state legislatures in North Dakota, state legislators in North Dakota see some of the light on that. Um, but it's our priority to advocate for us to at least get, um, Chairman Fox has made it a priority to, to talk about how within our exterior boundaries uh, that we would, you know, it's ours. It's, it's ours and we should be getting 100% of it in, in general. And so somebody we, in the past had agreed or had signed into it. It doesn't sound like a very good agreement. But, well, uh, Governor Hoven uh, understood that there, when we look at business, uh, then Governor Hoven, excuse me, Senator at this time, your colleague, um, knew and understood the business, the simple business fact that stability is needed and um, predictability. And so one of the ways to be able to do that to not have a, us implement each at that time at 11 and percent, so which would have came up to 23 percent total to do business on the reservation, it would have discouraged it. And so we had the foresight enough to at least come to that type of agreement to be able to come to the table and talk about that to negotiate that. And so the revenues that we've seen have been what we haven't seen before, and and it's something that where we as a government see this as our opportunity to generate that revenue that way for All right, our if you give us a break now just for the for the committee so I'd like to sure. see that um victoria uh it's easier to pronounce i can't pronounce your last name so kitchian kitchian okay miss kitchian um uh, we have been working on the issue uh, your uh, your congressman has been very diligent uh, in this uh in getting the resources uh, that were necessary to fix that problem with CMS, and, and uh, that's been a, it's an embarrassment to, to all of us. I'm sorry that that occurred, uh, but uh, it, I, this sounds from your testimony that progress is slow. I mean, it, uh, we have we put significant resources in that. Are you, are you seeing any improvement? Uh, well, now, now where we find ourselves are in the midst of negotiations, and now the challenge is that we still want to have access to those emergency accreditation dollars, and um, after July 1, we're still going to have these concerns and working through that issue for, I, I hope, not three years, but we're going to need the resources to, with the lack of third-party revenue sitting there in a reserve or, or anything, um, we're going to need all the help, support, and um, dollars to make this a su success. And that's, that's where we're working now with um, our congressmen to make sure that um, that language um, speaks to that access. Yeah, well, we'll continue to work with, with him and you, and uh, hopefully we can get this problem fixed as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. And uh, we appreciate uh, we appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Shell, uh, you know, again, a common theme here uh, has been this uh, drug addiction and opioid and methamphetamine. Uh, it's it's a plague, especially in Indian country. It seems, especially in it seems in your region and. Uh, it's, it's a horrendous thing. It has ongoing costs. You asked the question, does methamphetamine have long-term mental health effects? Yes, it does. It, it virtually burns up the brain, and, uh, it, and it's irretrievable. And so uh, that, that education needs to take place with young people. That, uh, they're basically taking poison. Well, it's, certainly uh, it's, uh, the reservations in our particular area that we're identifying Out in those rural areas, and yeah, yeah, terrible thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a horrible problem, Miss McCullum. Well, thank you. And as you had just uh, pointed out in your testimony, um, you were part of the Sioux Nation in Minnesota. Yes. A little thing called the Civil War was going on and people weren't paying attention here at the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, and this will come as a shock to you, about what one of the Indian agents was failing to do <laughs> in distributing uh, treaty allotments, um, provisions that um, the Sioux Nation was entitled to. And rather than Little Crow made a decision, it was controversial even among the Sioux with, with the decision that Little Crow made, and. He said enough is enough, and he went and um, he said he was going to take care of his people. And so the Sioux uprising uh, happened. We just had a reconciliation with that in, in Minnesota, and large thanks to Chairman Crooks 
uh, at our historical society and the ride that takes place uh, coming back to Mankato. But it is a, a great blot on Minnesota's history that we are the state in the union that's that where the largest mass execution took place. It would have been larger had not finally President Lincoln paid a little attention to what was going on in Indian country in Minnesota. And it is uh, something which um, I, I can say as a Minnesotan who's not Native, not Native American in Minnesota, um, that is part of our historical trauma for many of us who have come to realize what happened. So the fact that you're removed from home, in fact, they're prohibited by an act of Congress from returning home to Minnesota is something when you talk about historical trauma that many of us in Minnesota to a degree share with you, sir. But we're not there yet. Uh, Tom? Uh, just, just quickly, if I may, uh, Mr. Wydow, and this arrangement that you have with the state government uh, where you essentially split the severance tax, did they provide any services back, any infrastructure, any, in other words, are some of those dollars going back to anything that's helpful uh, to the reservation? Um, sure, uh, Congressman. Just, uh, and committee and chair, Mr. Chairman, um, just to uh, FYI, uh, the reason why they're allowed to dual taxation is a, a bad case law, to be, to, be, to be honest with you. It's very bad case law. And it's kind of an outdated Supreme Court decision. And to answer your question, Congressman, minimal at best is, is the best way I can describe it. I know we have a grid partnership with the state of North Dakota, um, but overall it's minimal at best on the fringes of our reservation. The county governments um, do receive oil impact allocations. Unfortunately, they do not see fit to share with us directly or through the counties, um, which we have tribal roads that we have snow removal in North Dakota, as you all know, it snows up in North Dakota. <laughs> so we have to do that, and generally that comes out of our own funds. Um, we get a million dollars for the entire reservation for our roads construction from BIA. So a million dollars on a million acres just does not suffice, and so our tribal dollars go to that, and the state, I would, like I said, at best gives minimal amounts of improvements or any kind of construction uh, costs or anything as such to us. Um, we don't receive it. Um, it's something that I will and I can get a breakdown for you on them. Yeah, I'm just curious. And again, I'm not trying to stick my nose into North Dakota affairs. Okay. In Oklahoma, um, we don't have reservations. We have 39 tribes with no reservations. So what they can do is put their land into trust within the old historic boundaries. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do have agreements with the state government, uh, for instance, on a certain amount of fuel tax <laughs> revenue. It's not the same as your situation. Uh, the only tribe that still has a mineral estate in Oklahoma or the Osage. And so, again, it's very different. But, I mean, that was the point. That we said, okay, if we're going to actually charge the state fuel tax on our land and, and you can't drive an interstate without crossing Indian trust land, in Oklahoma, then we expect a percentage of that, a negotiated percentage of that back, which we will use on our land. Otherwise, we won't charge any state taxes at all. We'll charge the federal taxes and we'll have a huge price advantage and guess where everybody will come. Uh, and uh, so that sobered up the legislature and the state government and they got very serious about negotiating with us. And we have, I wouldn't say it's a great deal, but it's a much better deal than what we had. And, and uh, uh, it gives us control of a lot more road money within our area that, that the, and we quite often uh, work jointly with our county governments or the, even the state government. Uh, so I'm just curious if something like that could be arrived at. I know historically before you arrived at that agreement, the amount of money coming out with no money coming back was just overwhelming. I mean, basically you're charging state taxes for oil being extracted on Indian land and nobody coming back and using that to build roads or infrastructure or anything like that. That was, quote, a federal responsibility. So I'm glad you at least made the progress you made. If my good friend from Oklahoma would yield, yield for a yield second. Certainly yield to my friend. Um, Mr. Whitehall, um, part of what you mentioned with your public safety going up are people coming onto reservation lands who are not part of the reservation. So you're also picking up a large portion of public safety costs that are not um, being created by uh, tribal members. Is that not correct, too? Uh, yes, ma'am. That is very prevalent, unfortunately, with, um, 
with the new development that is occurring and the opportunity that it does bring, um, it does bring not only good opportunity, but some of the bad that comes along with it. And unfortunately, we have the jurisdictional issues and the different things that go on with that, and we take the brunt of that with our tribal budget. And unfortunately, it's something that we definitely will, will need, but it could be uh, assisted if we can get some language to take away the ambiguity to where we can generate our own revenue. And that's what we're, that's what we really want to be the onus of our testimony today to be for MHA Nation is that we want to have your assistance on getting that gray area out and the ambiguity of it and allow us to generate our own revenue through taxation. Well, I, th I think Ms. Wright or Mr. Cole, Mr. Chair, so when their public um, safety costs go up, we're now paying for it oh, because no, they don't I, have as much. Was so, quite well made. So we, we've been watching. We get a lot of your news, so we've been watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a graduate from uh, Mankato State, actually, yeah, so <laughs> I, I kind of get some of your news, too. So. <laughs> uh, if we could, Ms. Kitchen, um, you know, uh, as you know uh, better than any of us, we've had this challenge with uh, IHS facilities in the Great Plains. We had three of them decertified at one point. Two of them obviously have gotten back. Uh, at, uh, into certification, I assume. Uh, and I know at the time, uh, Secretary Burwell over at HHS uh, was, was very concerned. And she, there was actually a secretarial fund uh, that we replenish every year. It's sort of unspent money moves into the secretary's purview to be used for emergency type situations. And she actually directed quite a bit of that toward these three facilities. So it does, con and I know you're exactly correct, of course. Uh, Congressman Fortenberry has been a, a, he's not on the subcommittee, but he is on this committee and has been very, very uh, helpful and, and anxious to see we do the right things. Where, what are the areas where we fell short where, you know, two of these facilities were able to get recertified? What are the challenges uh, at Winnebago that that has not happened there? What are the shortcomings that CMS is citing? Administration. We've had, uh, well, that's the very top issue is we have had a revolving door of, I believe, I want to say 13. I can't even, I thought it was seven, but it's in the teens of how many CEOs we've had through the years. And so that, you know, um, compounds the problem within the, the facility. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've had a, at the area level, lack of continuity with the area director. And we're pleased to have, you know, a, an acting area director right now and and has been helpful but it, it's just with these changing players with without the authority or somebody that's not going to go out on a limb because you know they're only acting it's it it really um help makes things getting done difficult uh, it, it's enormous challenge it, just one or two other quick questions uh have you you're you're obviously involved very deeply in this in tribal sense uh, are you now taking over management of this? Is the tribe doing that? Uh, yes, we are um, engaged in self-governance negotiations, good. and we hope to finalize our funding and compact agreement this month, and we're going to assume um, assumption of that facility July 1. Uh, and, well, and so we're also, you know, looking for all the support and, and um, kind of cheerleaders as we take these next steps and, and put the pressure on the agency to do the right thing as well and for so we can um, we're standing up we're ready to do the work support us help us help us help well, ourselves I, I certainly hope we do and and we certainly should and IHS certainly should because uh, as you say the history of mismanagement isn't tribal mismanagement this is IHS mismanagement but I really want to applaud you for for choosing to go the self-governance route and take control I, mean, I watched this happen in my own tribe and uh, it was transformative. It's tough at the beginning, no question about it, but nobody looks after your own people like your own people. Uh, and uh, they are going to be there. They're not, you know, rotating in and out. And uh, the governance gets deeply involved. And frankly, we used to always joke uh, when ours were taken over, the first thing that our people noticed is the wait time began to drop because they couldn't call anybody at the IHS, but they could sure get a hold of a tribal legislator pretty fast. Uh, and they all knew where everybody lived. And so things started to get better, more, if you will, customer and consumer responsive because, again, it was your friends and neighbors that were in these these positions. So I'll monitor this and uh, anything we can do to help I want, want to do. But I, I, 
you know, and it's always a tribe's choice. I'm never critical if they want to stay within the IHS system as opposed to, to take it over themselves, but just my experience has been over time uh, that you will have been, you will benefit very greatly from the decision that you've made. Uh, I think it will work to the advantage of, uh, of your tribe and, and your people. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, and uh, thanks to this panel for your testimony, and uh, we appreciate your coming. Uh, next, our last panel. Um, please uh, come forward. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to let you know that Oglala Sioux Tribe, yeah. that's our tribe, and Rosebud Sioux Tribe have yeah. not been recertified. Well, so that's good to know because the they're tribes. still not certified. No. Great, great. How are you doing? I just to try and get recertified. Yeah. Okay. I think there needs to be a way to have CMS give technical assistance to IHS to help us become recertified because right now we're not. I mean, and we're just we're in the same boat as. Well, thank you for letting me know because yeah. we've been advised otherwise. So good. Well, yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Could you uh, recognize me real quickly? Because I want to correct the record on something I said. Mr. Cole is recognized. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to correct the statement that I made. Uh, those three facilities that were decertified, I was just told they have not, two of them have not been recertified. So I was in error. All of them still have the same set of problems. And uh, they're, they're in negotiations with CMS and IHS, and that really is a shameful thing this many years after the fact that uh, uh, we haven't been able to, to get those facilities up and running uh, with full certification, because these are pretty isolated uh, locations that just simply aren't getting it. So I, I regret to have misadvised the committee, and I want to correct the record that we still got a big problem in these other I, two. I'm so. say it's, it's not just a money issue, as you know, Mr. Cole, yeah. because we're, we're putting money into this thing, and so it's, uh, our attention needs to be uh, put to that, so thank, thank you. Uh, so our, this panel, it's our last panel. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to recognize uh, J. Michael uh, Chavaria. Is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you're the governor of the Pueblo Santa Clara and also the chairman of the eight northern uh, Indian Pueblos in New Mexico. Welcome. And uh, you're, uh, you're recognized. Well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'd first like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before uh, the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Michael uh, Chavaria. As mentioned, I am the governor of Santa Clara Pueblo, uh, the chairman of the Eight Northern Indian Pueblos Council, and also the vice chairman of the All Pueblo Council of Governors, which are the 19 Pueblos in New Mexico, plus one Pueblo, Isla del Sur, uh, in Texas. As the subcommittee is well aware, the federal budgeting process reflects the political nature of our government-to-government -government, uh, relationship and the United States trust responsibility to protect the interests of tribal nations. One of the common interests of all nations is the advancement and protection of public health. The community health representatives play a, cent a central role in fulfilling this goal in Indian country. They're a reliable source of basic health care, disease prevention, transportation, and health uh, education services. This is particularly important in rural communities like ours. Uh, where access to high-quality care poses a constant challenge. CHRs are seen as trusted providers in our Pueblo because they come from and are based within the local communities within Santa Clara Pueblo. Their unique knowledge of the local cultural norms and practices, coupled with the high-quality medical training, makes them invaluable assets to the Indian healthcare system. Today, almost 1,400 CHR uh, folks serve the 250 communities uh, so our Pueblo is deeply troubled uh, by the President's proposal to eliminate all funding for the CHR program. Without federal support, the health and welfare of Indian country will unnecessarily harm, will be harmed by the loss of these valuable and vital health care providers. So we urge the subcommittee to maintain CHR funding in FY19 to protect community-based uh, health care. Any discussion of community health must include the natural uh, environment. EPA funding and grants enable our our public to support a array of projects to improve the quality of health and life for our people. Among the widely, widely used, utilized grant is the General Assistance Program, also known as GAP. 
Gap assist enables assistance enables us to administer essential services such as clean drinking water and hazardous waste removal. Proposed cuts to the gap will directly impact our, our Pueblo's Natural Resource Department and place the human health and risk and environment, environmental quality of our community at risk. We strongly urge the subcommittee to provide full funding uh, for the EPA General Assistance Program to advance uh, sustainable environmental management uh, practices. Sustainability has taken on a new urgency as we face growing challenges related to our increasing unstable natural environment. Catastrophic wildfires and flooding, and flooding has devastated our Pueblo in 1998, 2000, and 2011. Other communities, both tribal and non-tribal, have experienced snowfalls, droughts, agricultural blitz, and other natural phenomena of alarming strength and ferocity. The BIA Climate Change Resilient Program provides tribal nations with the tools to manage resource stressors and develop adaptive uh, management practices. It has also encouraged tribal nations to coordinate with local, regional, and state actors to maximize the impact of these practices for the benefit of all Americans. We recommend Congress uh, appropriate $30 million for the BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Program and FY19 to continue this important work. Tribal nations must also be prepared to respond to natural disasters at only a moment's notice. Unfortunately, our Pueblo has extensive experience in this area. For us, one of the greatest challenges was obtaining quick access to funding and resources. Bureaucratic delays and distributing funds coupled with high cost sharing requirements and upfront invest investments placed a heavy burden on our tribal government, as well as many other tribal nations in this similar situation. So no programs currently exist to meet the needs of tribal nations uh, during this situation that do not qualify for FEMA disaster declarations. We recommend Congress close this dangerous gap by establishing a BIA emergency response fund to quickly funnel resources and funds to tribal nations in disaster situations. I have also submitted a lengthy uh, written testimony for the record, but also invite chairman, members of the committee to come out and visit us uh, in New Mexico, the 19 Pueblos. Uh, come to one of our feast days, enjoying the feast food and activities. You're all welcome to come and visit. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify before this committee. I look forward to working with you to address these pressing needs uh, into the future. So uh, thank you very much in my native language. Thank, thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you much for your testimony. Uh, next is uh, Kurt Riley, Governor of the Pueblo of Acoma and Chairman of the 10 Southern Pueblo Governor Councils of New Mexico. Welcome, sir. You're recognized. Good afternoon, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCullum, and Congressman Cole. Uh, my name is Kurt Riley. I am the governor, appointed governor for the Pueblo of Acoma. Acoma is still a traditional form of government, and so our religious leaders appoint the tribal leadership on an annual basis for a term of one year. I've been honored to have been appointed twice before. This is my third year, and I'm also the chairman of the 10 Southern Public Council of Governors, and I also sit on the All Public Council of Governors and co-chair the Health and Natural Resources Committee of that entity. I do have a prepared statement, and I did want to cover four areas, but I'm going to um, hopefully express myself from, from my heart. I've been involved in tribal government for the last four years, actually. And it's disheartening to my uh, personal observation that at every turn, our tribal sovereignty is being evaluated and questioned. The Pueblo government governors hold three canes, and they are provided to them as a symbol of their authority and sovereignty of the Pueblo. In my home, I care for three canes one issued by the Spanish government, the Mexican government, and the Abraham Lincoln cane. That is truly our right to say that we are sovereign entities. We do not and have not signed a treaty with the United States government because we were included in two international governments, much like my brother here from Santa Clara. But recently, with the statements coming out of CMS in regards to their issues regarding 
exemptions to be wavered for tribal entities. And questioning it as a civil rights issue, I think is inappropriate. And I would hope that you know the, the subcommittee members would support us in maintaining our uniqueness as a sovereign and our government to government relationships. However, I did want to mention a few things within these budgetary um, hearings. I am grateful that in last year, a million dollars was dedicated to the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act. I don't know if you know, but ACOMA has been heavily involved in repatriating its ACOMA shield. And it encourages us to um, been working with various federal agencies, including the State Department, in an attempt to get that back. Part of that million dollars has been used to establish a um, cultural unit within the BIA. And so we were hoping and advocate now that that tribal uh, unit still be maintained. As a matter of fact, I spoke with the BIA folks in the Department of Justice and also uh, locally, and they are planning to have more training and are, being, uh, are considering offering that training to other federal agencies. Um, second, our cultural and spiritual heritage is conveyed not only in objects of tribal patrimony, which I just talked about, but in many sacred sites that dot the landscape in the Southwest. And so tribal historic preservation offices play an essential role in identifying these sites. The Pueblo of Acoma just recently got recognized as a tribal historic preservation office. We are working very much um, in that regard in the Navajo Gallup Supply and Water Project. We are on the ground identifying ahead of this pipeline cultural resources and advising the Bureau of Reclamation how they can redesign the pipeline in order to provide these cultural sites and cultural uh, items of patrimony that are being identified. So we are hopeful that the continued budget, both for the cultural patrimony unit within the BIA and for tribal historic preservation offices is, are maintained. Um, I do have just a short uh, period of time left, but I am also very well aware of the issues within the Indian Health Service. I was a former Navy corpsman, served in the military but I also, also was a commissioned officer within the Public Health Service. So I know the uh, issues within Indian Health Service. I know that when Indian Health Service was granted uh, the ability to bill for third party revenue, a huge impact that made on us. And so um, I'd be open for any questions, um, but thank you very much for allowing me this time. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, uh, Angelique. Albert, uh, Executive Director of the American Indian Graduate Center. Well, you're recognized. Good afternoon, Chairman Calvert. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Chairman Calvert, <coughs> Ranking Member McCullough, and Mr. Cole, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Angelique Albert. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes from Northwest Montana. Um, I worked in Indian country for over 20 years in various capacities, and I'm honored today to present my testimony as the Executive Director of American Indian Graduate Center. I'm also honored today to have two of my board members joining me. I have Ms. Um, Holly Cook Macaro and Mr. Walter Lamar behind me. They're right behind me. <laughs> um, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I am here today to request the restoration of and increase funding to the BIE Special Higher Education Program and the Science Postgraduate Scholarship Fund. Both of these vitally important programs are currently administered by American Indian Graduate Center and were eliminated in the President's proposed FY 2019 budget. American Indian Graduate Center is the oldest and largest scholarship provider to American Indian students nationally. We are approaching our 50th anniversary of providing scholarships to students in any field of study in any accredited college. 
Thanks to these two critical programs, we have been able to provide funding to approximately 13,000 students from over 400 tribes in all 50 states as well as the District of Columbia. In addition to the extensive reach of these programs, let me talk for a moment about the impact. Before these programs were implemented, we had a total of 30 tribal medical doctors and 38 tribal lawyers in the entire United States. The SHEP and SPGSF programs have directly impacted these numbers <coughs> by funding over 1,200 medical students and 1,300 lawyers, law students. We are currently in our fourth year of administering the SPGSF program and our data analytics from the first three years show an unprecedented graduation rate of 95%. This far exceeds the 41% national post-secondary graduation rate for American Indian students given by the National Center for Educational S Statistics. Additionally, we are proud to highlight 66% of the scholars in this STEM program are female. This is also unprecedented. Women make up 35% of all STEM degree holders in this country and female students receive fewer STEM degrees than males in every ethnic group. Statistics and numbers are but one way of showcasing su success. The true impact lies in the essential, uh, of these essential programs lie in the stories and lives of the 13,000 individuals touched. Dr. Rebecca St. Germain, a member of the Lakota Ray Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, graduated from the University of Minnesota with a PhD in social and administrative pharmacy. She told me directly that her life was transformed by the SPGSF program. This funding has empowered her to become Commissioner of Health and Human Services for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, seeing, uh, overseeing three districts as well as urban offices. Stories like Rebecca's highlight the sound investment these programs make in developing human capital in this country. These programs are a vital source of funding that many students would otherwise not have the, uh, would not be able to afford higher education. The SHEP and SPGSF programs for provide scholarship awards ranging from $1,000 to $30,000 each, with the average award being $5,000. As tuition costs for graduate school at a public university average in excess of $30,000 per year, funding from these programs clearly do not eliminate the student's obligation to pay for their own education. The funding generally reduces the burden of student debt that they take on in pursuit of their academic goals. Lastly, I would like to note that an abrupt program elimination in FY 2019 is a serious concern to us, given the number of current students who are attending schools and receiving fellowships through the programs who would be suddenly without financial assistance. I fully recognize the financial um, challenges that control the subcommittee's actions this year. However, I would like to respectfully request strong and continued funding for the SHEP and SPGSF programs at or above the previously funded levels. These programs will ensure American Indian and Alaska Native students are provided the opportunity to attend quality higher educational institutions, fulfill their academic dreams, and contribute their expertise to our greater communities. Lem Lemch, thank you all for your thoughtful consideration of my request and for your time today. Thank you. Welcome, sir. You're uh, recognized. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members. As you mentioned, my name is Lawrence Maribal. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the college. IAIA is chartered by the United States Congress to empower creativity and leadership in Native arts and culture. IAIA is the place where contemporary Native arts were born. The Institute of American Indian Arts is a place that embraces the past, enriches the present, and creates the future. IAIA is only one of three colleges in the United States chartered directly by the Congress. The power and uniqueness of IAIA's mission is undeniable and makes it clear that the college truly is a national treasure. IAIA's congressional nonprofit charter encourages the college to raise funds from private sources while authorizing basic core funding from Congress. Over the course of 30 years, the college has risen to this challenge. Evidence of this can be found in the college's operating budget. 
As of the most recent fiscal year, over 29% of the budget came from non-appropriation sources. It is an exciting time on campus as the college currently offers bachelor programs in studio arts, cinematic arts and technology, creative writing, museum studies, and indigenous liberal studies. A graduate program in creative writing is also offered. Additionally, the college recently reintroduced its performing arts program, focusing on the performing arts from an indigenous viewpoint. The performing arts program occupies a newly constructed performing arts and fitness center on the IAIA campus, a 24,000 square foot state of the art facility. The college serves more than 500 students representing over 90 tribes from across North America. These truly are the success stories of our native youth. I express gratitude to this subcommittee for securing forward funding for the college. This allows the college to align its fiscal year funding with the beginning of the academic year. This allows for improved planning of expenditures to address the needs of our students, thereby promoting their success. We are appreciative of the subcommittee's work and for your strong, consistent support of our core funding request throughout the appropriations process. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students, I request the subcommittee's support for the administration's fiscal year 19 budget request of $9.96 million. The federal funding request in fiscal year 19 will assist IAIA in addressing the following priorities. IAIA continues to experience tremendous growth. With over 600 students enrolled at the beginning of the 17-18 academic year, this number represents an increase to enrollment of over 35% in just five short years. We believe this is not only due to the unique world-class education we offer, but also because of the incredible value that IAIA brings to the table. Student success continues to be at the forefront of IAIA strategic planning. This is evident in several new initiatives that the college has introduced. First, the college has included all required textbooks into the cost of tuition. This means students have all of their books on the first day of class with absolutely no money out of their pocket. This increases the odds of students successfully completing their semester. Second, IAIA has begun to offer a four for three plan. Students that choose to participate in this plan commit to completing their undergrad degree in four years. If the student is successful in completing their degree on time, the college issues a refund on all tuition charged for the student's senior year. IAIA experienced tremendous development in program offerings. Performing arts has been reintroduced after being eliminated in the 1990s due to deep federal budget cuts. Additionally, the college's first master's level program in creative writing continues to thrive, with 65 students earning an MFA since its launch in 2013. This growth requires additional faculty to be added to serve these areas. The college continues to complete the build-out of its campus, adding more than 100,000 square feet of operating space, with several new campus buildings being constructed in the last eight years. Although these are very efficient green buildings that are LEED designed, energy and maintenance cost increases are inevitable. In summary, IAIA's top priority is to enhance our ability to further our mission of empowering creativity and leadership in native arts and cultures through higher education, lifelong learning, and outreach. To continue this important work, I respectfully request that this subcommittee support the administration's request for IAIA of $9.96 million. The students, faculty, and staff greatly appreciate your consideration. This concludes my testimony. I thank the chairman and the committee members for the opportunity to speak on behalf of IAIA. I also want to invite all of you to visit us in Santa Fe to meet our talented students and to tour our beautiful campus and welcome any questions you may have at this time. Thank, thank you. And, uh we have a great invitation to come out to New Mexico. We'd like to go see it all. Uh, I uh, love New Mexico. We have to probably go to the National Laboratory over there anyway. Tom and I, and they, we all serve on a committee that uh, funds that also, so we could probably kick it all in one trip. That would be a good way to do it. Yep, that's right. And uh, thank you for your uh, service, uh, uh, Corman. That's a tough job. Um, and uh, you have a tough job now, and and uh, and I let, I think I speak for everybody. We agree with that sovereignty is extremely important. I uh, Tom's already talked to me about this se several times. I'm sorry that uh, that happened. I suspect uh, hopefully that'll get fixed here pretty soon. Uh, but um, uh, obviously we're very interested in higher education, and uh, we'll be taking all that into account as we uh, uh, move this uh, process over. Uh, through here, we'll be 
moving forward on our uh, markup here pretty soon. With that, uh, Ms. McCullum. Well, um, thank you. I've had the privilege of being on both of both Pueblos. Um, uh, I don't know if, I, if it was the feast day of the deer, but they were doing the deer dance, and I have to tell you, going on a feast day is amazing. Everybody's serving chili in their house. You get to go to everybody's house, and you need to go with someone you trust who can tell you how hot the chili is. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. On another note, uh, in uh, Akama, uh, in your testimony, you reminded me of how you have a railroad track that um, that di uh, divides divides um, your community in half, right? Right. So the hospitals on one side and, and the rest. And when we were out there, you know, I was kind of like the railroad for lighting, you know, marking the gray, uh, mark, marking the crossing and all that. Has has anything changed since I've been out there? Maybe I think that was like eight years ago. Uh, chairman, members of the committee, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman. Nothing has changed. The the whole emphasis of of trying to get a bridge built across the railway is that the Indian Health Service facility lies to the north and the rest of the community, most of the community lies to the south of the railway. However, as time has co uh, come and gone, the, the expense is overwhelming for the tribe, even for a match. And so we're struggling to try to figure out how to get that bridge built. Um, and it's very important for us because it's, it's difficult to, to go over there to begin with. But I was stationed there when I first started with Indian Health Service. And the same issues as you've heard other tribes, I'm sure, um, say that recruitment is difficult. And it's only 50 miles away from Albuquerque. Housing is an issue. Education of individuals who wish to work there is an issue. So as far as my administration is concerned, we are trying to address every one of those recruitment hindrances. Housing jobs, education, infrastructure, um, the road leading up to the Indian Health Service facility needs repair. So no matter which way you look at it, you know, I, I think across the board, Indian country needs funding in every respect. Um, when I sit in council and I listen to all the coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know, it all boils down to lack of resources. Mm -hmm. And so we are willing to partner when we can, and we have in the past, when, when there's a cost share involved. Right now we're in a FEMA disaster. We self-declarated that. Um, we're grateful to, to the president to sign off on our declaration. And, but we have a cost share associated with that. Okay. Um, so to the governors, um, we've heard, th th this is the last panel, we've heard consistently from um, the tribal nations that with the reorganization um, that Secretary Zicke is looking at, and, and, and I agree with the, the tribes, and I, the tribes, we're all on the same page. Reorganization is a good thing to look at, but the way it's been gone about has been raising a lot of alarm bells. So, um, and it's not just the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's also Fish and Wildlife, BLM, everything else. So, to be consistent, um, uh, you as governors, have you been consulted? Have you had input? Have you been, you know, really collaborated with about what would make the most sense and efficiencies as we go, f if we are to go forward with a reorganization? I want to stress again, in case the secretary's listening, I'm not opposed to looking at an organ organizational change. It just needs to have all the partners at the table so that we get it right the first time because it's going to be expensive. So have you been part of a discussion? Um, we haven't, and that's where tribal consultation comes into play. And so when uh, federal actions are being evaluated, there's historical impacts that impact us as tribal nations. And it's not just ticking off the box. It's making sure that it's a, a good dialogue or you have the input from the tribes, may it be through the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, BIA, all within the interior, and it's not all the same. It's not one size fits all. 
And so it's important that you dialogue at the beginning so tribe and tribal leaders and their councils have an understanding of the direction uh, that Secretary Zinke is going. We did have an opportunity to meet with Secretary Zinke uh, last year when they were going through the Bears Ears uh, shrinkage. But trust responsibility of that was very important to understand. And I did share with him a public history uh, document from 1540 to 2005 of the Pueblo Lands Board Amendments of how the tribe has been neglected, the Pueblos in New Mexico have been neglected as it comes to trust responsibility and it's not based upon race. It's based upon the political status of us as sovereign governments. Mm -hmm. This is why it's important to dialogue on that direction of the reorg so we have an understanding how things are gonna operate because it impacts us and the, the services, functions, and activities that go along uh, with the federal government back down to the Pueblos. Issues of the city. Yeah. Yes. 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 I'll be brief in my response, Congresswoman. Um, I've learned a lot in the last three years. And to me, consultation is not just a one-time conversation. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing conversation between a federal agency and a respective tribe. To the, to the reorganization that Secretary Zinke is proposing, I would say, Pueblos, tribes, and nation in this country are not natural resources. And to reorganize based on drainage systems and watersheds is inappropriate and is not acceptable, at least to, to me. Thank you. Thank you. And to the two people down at the other end of the table, higher ed, I've been, just, I've been to Santa Fe, so I've kind of stuck my nose in the eye. IA, IA building and, and walked by it and exciting things going on, lots of smiles and a lot of energy when, when you're by the building and wow, you would you say 60, 60, 66% of the STEM graduates are women? 66% 66 66 and we're also um, thankful to see so many of our alumni come back to serve in public office and to work in BIE offices as well. So wow, I mean because I'll say how old I am, I'm 63, and we weren't encouraged to go into engineering, we weren't encouraged to, to go into science and that, so in one generation to turn that around, and to turn it around for, for young girls and young women to role model that in Indian country is just absolutely amazing, and when Indian country's doing better, the United States of Amer America does even better, so good for you, good for you. Mr. Cole. Um, well, if it makes you feel any better, uh, Ms. McCollum, you're the youngest person on this side of the dais. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to point that out, but I didn't know I saw that. <laughs> Member-wise, anyway, Darren, yeah, yeah, no yeah. offense. I'm the oldest one over here. <laughs> no, I, I just want to make a, a couple of uh, comments, as I know it's been a long day. And I, I want to I start by thanking our chairman. Uh, you, you make sure that these happen, and four panels in two days is an awful lot of work. And I want to thank our ranking member as well, who is always – uh, here, this is a. I think this is one of the most important things we do yeah. is make this committee available to anyone in Indian country because it's educational and it's always striking to me how diverse it all is. But at the same time, how often we hear the same things about tribal sovereignty, the trust responsibility, and underfunding. I mean, they're 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 woven through testimony, and they're all true. Uh, uh, but it's it's very very helpful to. Uh, to the committee. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Ranking Member, thank you, too, for continuing this tradition that's been here for some time, and, and thank the staff that puts this together uh, as well and reaches out into all of Indian Country and makes sure that we get a very good and representative sample. I, I want to add my voice uh, to Governor Riley, uh, and I'm going to end this where I began it. Uh, that CMS uh, memo is just simply one of the most outrageous things. I know all three of us have signed letters about that. Uh, Ms. McCollum and I are working on a joint letter about that. I think there's going to be a lot of congressional pushback on that. Uh, and uh, I know at least in my tribe, we, we, uh, I, I took the liberty of enclosing a legal memo that uh, our, our tribe's chief uh, lawyer had produced, chief counsel had produced, and, uh, and asked them to, could you please send us your legal justification? Because you cite statutes, but you, or you say you have statutory authority, but you never cite a statute. Uh, in that letter, and they, they talk about civil rights violations, but they never tell you what they would be. So um, we're quite willing to, to go chapter and verse, case by case, statute by statute, judicial decision by judicial decision why they're wrong. We'd just like uh, 
uh, and we, uh, I'll take this opportunity once again to, to invite uh, CMS to produce uh, this information because if they continue down this road, they may well have that opportunity in court, so they might as well do it now. Um, it's a big mistake, uh, and it, it suggests a, a profound misunderstanding by somebody over there as to what tribes do. Uh, we now have 40 members on the CMS uh, letter, and it's extremely bipartisan, roughly 50 50, so I think it gives you an idea of how strongly Congress feels about the issue that you raised, Governor. Um, thank you. And, and again, I associate myself with the Chairman. Thank you for your service uh, very, very much. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, both of our, uh, our, our participants at the other end of the table, too. You know, in the last uh, uh, panel, we heard about uh, all the shortcomings that we have in a number of our hospital facilities in the Great Plains. The best way to solve them is exactly what you're doing. Uh, you know, uh, we are much more likely to get people to go back that are from those areas and want to serve and want to participate. Uh, we do a lot of this, again, in my tribe. It has paid off huge for us. I mean, our health facility is run by Chickasaws that are trained, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's their aim when they go. And, and again, it, we should be doing this anyway. It's individuals. Uh, right to pick what they want to do, but we just know we have a much better chance of getting the skill sets that we need in Indian country if we give people the opportunity to get education. Uh, and I, you know, I've seen the same thing in the TRIO program. There's always a desire to think, oh, well, we'll help you get the four years, but then that's it, right? Well, you really do. If you To get the professionals you need, the lawyers you need, the doctors you need, uh, you know, th that takes a longer investment. And so thank you for what you're doing to make sure that that goes. I won't say in defense, but an explanation for the administration, to be fair to them, do remember their 19 budget was submitted before we had come to a congressional bipartisan agreement, an agreement involved legislation. So their numbers don't always match up to where we're going to be. I don't presume to say what we're going to do here. That's the chairman's uh, uh, prerogative. But um, I, I think, I think uh, uh, yeah, I, I think you're going to do a little bit better on our budget than you probably would with the president. So uh, having the chairman's assurance. So I, I just want to, again, end um, with this. Just thank you for what you all do. Uh, thanks for what you do for your respective tribes and people. I owe you a coin. I have mine here since you're handing them out. We'll even that up, Governor. But uh, and, and thank you for what you do in terms of making sure that our people have the opportunities to, to not only do well, but to come back and serve their own people if that's their choice, as it so often is. So with that, thank you again, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. for holding this hearing. Thank you, and uh, we certainly appreciate everyone who came out today and yesterday and the staff and the members that participated in these hearings. Very valuable, as, uh, as Mr. Cole pointed out, and uh, we certainly appreciate this, and we look forward to getting out to New Mexico, too. We're adjourned. Thank you.